welcome to the um, long-awaited launch of the patient Center uh, outcomes tools uh, here at the National Institutes of Health. I am uh, Susanna Serrat Stein. I am the director of the Division of Skin and Rheumatic Diseases at NIMS. But I am also the project officer for the Patient Reported Outcomes Measurement Information System, otherwise known as PROMIS. And it is my pleasure to introduce the uh, Patient Center Out Outcome Tool to the NIH here today. I would like to take a moment to thank all the institute di and center directors who are here. Uh, the NIH leadership has uh, all along since the beginning of uh, many of these projects back in the uh, 2002 to 2004 period shown uh, tremendous leadership support and commitment to the development of these tools which are essential to measure patient reported outcomes in chronic diseases. Um, they will uh, introduce uh, to you the components of, uh, of the, um, many of the components that uh, comprise uh, what we are now calling uh, uh, patient center outcome tools. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the team at Northwestern University, Dr. Richard Gershon, Karen Cook, Nan Rothkoch, and Monica Prudencio for coming uh, all the way from Chicago to make the presentation today. And especially, I would like to thank them for offering the training opportunity this uh, session this afternoon. I know a lot of people have registered for that. So we are excited that there, there is so much interest about learning how to use these tools here at NIH. We would like to, I would like also to thank uh, Dr. Yang Pan and his team at NINDS who work to implement uh, the assessment center, which is the vehicle to bring uh, PROMIS, NeuroQual, and the um, uh, toolbox uh, here to the clinical center and the intramural research programs uh, at NIH. Um, also, Dr. Margaret Vivens, who I know uh, uh, cannot be here today, and Katie Melure for taking the leap and uh, testing the assessment center and the different tools here at NIH before um, launching, uh, uh, the widespread launching here on campus. Um, I would like to thank also uh, the one person who had the vision and uh, the commitment to bring the assessment center and the tools to campus, and that is the chief science officer of the PROMIS initiative, Dr. Jim Witter. A um, few years back, Jim uh, realized uh, the importance of the tools and the relevance and the uh, <clears throat> potential impact that using the tools here at NIH could have in terms of understanding patient reported outcomes in rare diseases and unique in this very unique environment and very unique group of patients. And it really took him a couple of years to convince us all and to move this forward. Uh, and we am very grateful for his um, commitment and his perseverance in, in bringing, bringing these tools to campus. Um, I would like to thank you all for being here and all the people who are um, observing the, the presentation via videocast. And um, I, I think this is going to be uh, saved for future viewing as well. So if you cannot complete the viewing today, please come back and look at the NIH videocast site. This will be saved there. Um, now, um, briefly, the session this morning um, will begin with be, be the introduction of the different tools by the uh, NIH uh, Institute and Center's director after a brief introduction by Dr. Anderson, who is the director of the Common Fund. This will be followed by a presentation by Dr. Richard Gershon, who is the director of the Promise Assessment Center. and. Um, <clears throat> we will hear from intramural scientists who have pilot tested some of the tools, and this will be followed by Dr. Nanth Roth Rock from Northwestern and Dr. Yang Fan from NINDS, who will present on the assessment center and give a demonstration of this newly available NIH version. Uh, we ask that you please hold your questions until the end of the session. So all the speakers will convene here, and there will be time uh, for you to um, ask the questions uh, using the microphones that we have in the aisles. Our hope is that you will uh, leave the meeting today feeling excited about using PROMIS, NeuroQual, and the toolbox, 
and energize about this uh, growing f uh, field of uh, person-centered outcomes in patient care, clinical research, and clinical trials. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Jim Anderson, uh, who is the director of the Division of Program Coordination, Planning, and Strategic Initiatives that houses the Common Fund, who has provided support for uh, PROMISE. Thank Jim? you. Please. Thank you. Well, thank you for your interest in PROMISE. Um, and I also I want to thank the team that delivered on PROMISE. This is a fantastic Common Fund project. Uh, it originated in 2003 as part of the roadmap planning process. There, the need was identified to have a valid uh, approach or method to study patient symptoms and other outcomes, particularly in chronic diseases, conditions where, where an X-ray or a sodium level isn't going to tell you the story. So this was a research tool. And I've been here a little over three years. I remember the first time I met with the PROMISE team. Um, I had read up a little bit on the program, but was very uninformed. And I was ready to ask, what is computer adaptive testing? And I, I remember this aha moment during their presentation when I said, oh, you can actually repeatedly, in a standardized way, measure symptoms for your research studies? Uh, and I just embraced this as, as, as a real common fund project. Why? Because it's important for multiple ICs, because it's identified an obstacle for progress in research uh, across a wide number of areas, and more importantly, because it identified a deliverable, which if it were produced would really transform the way the science could be done. And that's what they've done. These are a remarkable set of tools. Uh, so remarkable and so successful, they're being widely adapted. Uh, they're now being introduced for use by EPIC, the Department of Defense, uh, CMS, ACORI is showing interest now. This, is, this will also enter clinical practice, too, as a validated way of quantifying symptoms and other outcomes. So, again, I want to thank the team. I hope that folks here in the clinical center will uh, adopt and also adapt the methods that uh, PROMISE has delivered. Uh, and since I represent the Common Fund everywhere I go, uh, I want to say this is now 10 years. Uh, and we will be having a celebration in Nature on June 19th, recognizing the successes of the Common Fund over the last decade and, and the process that the Common Fund do, uses to, to uh, do new types of science. And PROMISE will be represented that day. So thank you. Please adopt and adapt. Because I'm not sure everybody on the web heard. Uh, what Susanna just said. I'm Steve Katz, director of the National Institute of, Arth uh, of Arthritis and Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases. And um, along with uh, Josie Briggs and her predecessor, Steve Strauss, uh, we really uh, have uh, co-chaired this from a director's standpoint, this uh, uh, PROMISE initiative. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining uh, today. And uh, I do want to give a special thanks to uh, Susanna and Jim Witter, who have really been leading this effort on behalf of a large group of people represented from uh, various, uh, various institutes. Uh, we, uh, uh, let me just go into a little more detail than Jim went into, because I actually was here in 2003 when all of this started. And one third of the segment of the, of the uh, roadmap for medical research that uh, Elias uh, Zahuni uh, put together uh, uh, amongst all of the uh, all of the institute directors, one third of it was geared towards uh, clinical research, and uh, this segment, one, one third, uh, the the CTSAs actually came out of that uh, extra money for the for the GCRCs, but uh, one third of that uh, did, did was uh, uh, particularly focused on clinical research, and a segment of that uh, was focused on uh, getting patients' voices heard in terms of outcomes. Uh, there were many uh, instruments that were available. They were cumbersome uh, and, uh, and burdensome, and they were not 
uh, really translatable uh, from one area to the other. So with the help of, uh, really, Larry Friedman was so, uh, was so critically involved, Larry Friedman from NHLBI, that we, uh, we uh, put together this, uh, uh, this uh, initiative. And um, the acronym is great, isn't it? it? It really reflects what this is all about. Patient, reported, outcomes, measurement, information system. That's what it's about. And basically, it covers a broad range of uh, patient-reported outcomes in a number of areas, pain, fatigue, functioning, emotional distress, so social role participation, and minimizes patient burden when answering questions so that you don't have to go through a thousand questions uh, to, to, get the, uh, uh, to get the answer. And that's what computer adaptive testing is all about that, uh, that Jim is, is ta uh, talked about. Promise measures can be used as primary or secondary endpoints in clinical studies of the effectiveness of treatment. It can be used to design treatment plans, improve communication between patients and physicians, and manage chronic disease. And in doing all of this, we didn't do this uh, out of the landscape of, uh, of having the FDA at the table. The FDA has been at the table. In fact, Jim Witter was at the FDA when all of this was started, and it was uh, to our benefit that he came over so that uh, he could encourage its use uh, here. Uh, not only uh, across the NIH extramural programs, but the purpose of today's meeting is really to educate our intramural program as well as some of our extramural uh, uh, program staff as to what uh, PROMISE is all about. PROMISE actually allows for apples to apples comparisons of results across studies, something not currently possible with other measurement systems. It also includes, for example, not only adults, but also children, uh, ch very young children. It allows for a parent, uh, at parents as surrogates for, uh, for children, and uh, it, uh, it allows for use uh, with all individuals regardless of literacy, language, physical function, or life course. What are the future directions? Well, we've seen a, a real uptick in the utilization of the PROMISE uh, database uh, that, is, uh, that is housed at, uh, at Northwestern. We've seen a real uptick in studies that are being uh, performed in terms of clinical and, and uh, uh, intervention studies in clinical medicine, and uh, we hope that it will be continue to be used uh, and, uh, as Jim said, uh, adopted and adapted. So in closing, I would note that in 10 years since PROMISE started, and this is one of the first, actually, of the Common Fund projects, and I think the very first that has actually uh, been transformed to a point where the institutes are supporting it rather than the common fund, or the common fund to a lesser extent, uh, we would consider that a success because there is enthusiasm for taking it up. Perhaps the most uh, uh, tangible evidence of this is the establishment of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, the PCORI, uh, that I know my uh, colleague and friend Josie Briggs is going to be talking about how it's being adapted there and other things. So thank you very much for being here. So I'm Josie Briggs. I'm the director of the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. Uh, and uh, like uh, Steve, I was part of the working group uh, established by Dr. Zerhouni uh, to, quote, transform clinical research. My, uh, and that was chaired by my predecessor, Steve Strauss, and Steve Katz. We called it the Steves. And uh, it was very clear to Steve Strauss who, uh, that the uh, field of measuring uh, the value of complementary uh, health practices was very centered on their impact on symptoms. Patients turn to a variety of health practices, whether it's meditation or dietary supplements or chiropractors, uh, because of symptoms. And our, the va potential value of these approaches lay, it lies in uh, their ability to contribute to symptom management. So Steve understood very clearly and focused in on the need for more rigorous and consistent methods 
for measuring uh, human symptoms. Uh, I was intrigued by this whole initiative. At that time, I was running, overseeing a number of large clinical trials in kidney disease, uh, and I was uh, seeing the conservatism of clinical investigators who would put in front of patients at each visit a stack of paper questionnaires, uh, two hours of, of uh, uh, filling in forms, and I didn't think we were really capturing uh, elements of quality of life. Uh, or uh, the impact of our interventions on, on how they were living. But I don't think any of us actually could see the future at that time. And that's one of the interesting things about looking back at the 10 years of this initiative. I think Promise has been transformative in a way we didn't expect. We didn't realize the way in which uh, patient-centeredness would become a hallmark of change in our healthcare system. So I'm very pleased right now to be interacting a lot with things happening in, in PCORI. PCORI has uh, uses as their uh, uh, branding patient-centeredness, and it's an interesting change that's going to occur in our research processes as we see uh, building more into research studies uh, a uh, centeredness on what patients want and, and how they perceive uh, treatments. Uh, this is very uh, uh, in sync with where I see NCAM's mission uh, should evolve and very central to employing the kind of uh, measures that are uh, uh, being have been developed by, by uh, PROMISE and by the methodology that PROMISE has, has uh, developed. One of the things that was certainly an education for me in overseeing the evolution of, of PROMISE is the whole science of uh, biometrics and the methods that PROMISE has developed for validating individual uh, elements uh, of utilizing computer adaptive testing and, and really learning how to select uh, uh, items that will actually accurately uh, and as efficiently as possible measure uh, the uh, patient's uh, evolving symptomatology is an important part of PROMISE's contribution and, and something I think that will require uh, continued investment. PCORI is uh, intense, the PCORI leadership are intensely aware of these issues uh, and have committed uh, to uh, utilization of, of many promise measures and to continued investment in it. And I think all of us who see uh, patient symptoms as central in our research will, will uh, stay similarly committed. So it's a wonderful thing this is now going to be here on this campus and, and a, a part of the fabric of, of clinical investigation here in our own hospital. NCAM is uh, now in the process of uh, launching a program that's focused on pain management. Uh, and Dr. Catherine Bushnell is the scientific director. She's recruited three uh, terrific young scientists and building a pain program. And so measuring pain outcomes and all the ways in which pain impacts on, on quality of life uh, will be very central in that program. And so I am just thrilled that the Promise tools are now going to be here uh, ready for uh, the work that, that we are initiating. So I think this should be a great day. I look forward to seeing the webcast uh, and thank everyone here uh, for their interest in this. Uh, for those listening on the webcast, in case you did not hear, I'm Marie Bernard, Deputy Director of the National Institute on Aging. Richard Hodes sends his regrets that he's not able to be here. Uh, we have been working with a collaborative group with the NIH Toolbox, um, and we're really pleased that this is now going to be part of the NIH Assessment Center. The Toolbox was released to the extramural community just a year ago right here in Missouri. Uh, it is very similar in some ways to PROMISE in that it allows us to compare apples to apples when it comes to behavioral and neurological outcomes. It provides a set of brief, well-validated measures to assess cognitive, motor, 
sensory and emotional function in individuals aged 3 to 85. Major initiatives employing the NIH toolbox include the Human Connectome Project and the vanguard phase of the National Children's Study with plans to use the measures in the primary study as well. The idea for the toolbox was brought forward in 2005 to the NIH Blueprint for Neuroscience Research by NIA, NINDS, and NIMH. And it received unanimous, enthusiastic agreement among the 15 institute directors at that time. Uh, therefore, a contract was awarded in late 2006 to Northwestern University to lead the development of the toolbox. And over the course of time, some 250 researchers and measurement experts have been involved in its development. There are a number of goals associated with the toolbox. Uh, very importantly, a uh, primary goal is to respond to the research community's need for uniform measures that could be used as a form of common currency, or again, allowing comparison of apples to apples across diverse study designs and populations, enabling researchers to share, compare, compare and combine research data. Additionally, uh, it was meant to establish instruments that would assess function and change in function over time in order to allow measurement of health span and avoid the pitfalls using uh, instruments that were designed for measuring and or for diagnosing diseases. It provides standardized measures for neurological and behavioral research that can be used for large-scale longitudinal and epidemiological studies, clinical studies. And as we all know, we're uh, investing more and more in the get those sorts of studies are getting more and more expensive. Uh, the advantage of the, the tools that are available through the NIH toolbox is that they will allow neurological and behavioral assessment in these sorts of studies uh, without, addition, with significant, without significant increases in administration time or cost, uh, allowing further enhancement of these sorts of studies. In closing, I'd like to describe ways in which you can help to expand this unique resource uh, and make it even more universal. Uh, we hope that you'll use it and become familiar with the instruments within it uh, and apply it to your research and your patient populations, and that very importantly, that you'll provide feedback so that there may be the future possibility of these instruments becoming validated for things ranging from ADHD to major depressive disorders to Alzheimer's disease, uh, as well as using these for the examination of potential neural and behavioral sequelae of cardiovascular disease, major uh, musculoskeletal disease, renal disease, or diabetes. So we look forward to your feedback. Thanks. Thank you. Next, uh, we will hear from Dr. Tori Landy, who is going to introduce the uh, NIH uh, Neuroform. So I have to say I was extremely dubious about Promise 10 years ago, and dubious about the toolbox, um, and even a little bit dubious about the um, piece that I'm going to tell you now, but it's very clear in retrospect that I was wrong, <laughs> that this whole initiative was incredibly prescient and leaves NIH and NIH-funded investigators um, really poised to take advantage of these tools in looking at patient-centered outcomes. And I hope that intramural investigators will embrace these tools and use them. So the NeuroQual is focused on a quality of life for patients with neurological disorders. And um, just as Jim said, it's not in a potassium test or a blood pressure. The impact of neurological disorders on the life of patients is much more complex than what we measure in a routine examination. One of the common exams for muscular dystrophy, for example, is a six-minute walk. It's a useful measure, but it's really not enough because it matters where you walk, why you walk there, and it's important to know that you can manage your finances, maintain a household, plan social events, all the kinds of elements that make up the quality of life. So health-related quality of life is particularly important in chronic diseases, including many neurological disorders where our effective treatments are limited 
and the focus of care is often on minimizing the negative impact of the disease and, and in fact, its treatments. So the um, pieces of, of Promise and Toolbox and NeuroQual that um, complement traditional assessments allow the caretaker or the patient to report their experience of the disease and, and how the treatment is actually um, helping the patient with quality of life. And one of the things that's become um, very clear to me in the past six months is there's huge relevance here to our ability to translate and have accepted as a new valid treatment um, these kinds of tools because the FDA is interested not in whether for neurological diseases you know, you have a little less tremor. They're really interested in what the quality of life is. So NeuroQual was developed um, consistent with the USD FDA guidance on patient reported outcome instrument development. And our early results suggest that it has good quality and validity and, and it could become an accepted, if not required, endpoint in clinical trials. So the, this tool, um, its development used expert interview, patient focus groups, large samples, and advanced psychometric methods to develop a set of instruments, both in English and Spanish, that can be used to assess the quality of life of adults and children with common neurological disease. And so we've actually validated this with adults um, suffering from epilepsy, Parkinson's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease, a deadly disease, five years from diagnosis to death, stroke or MS, and children with epilepsy or muscular dystrophy. So it's available for research purposes without charge. It has a core set of questions that cut across chronic neurological disorders and supplemental questions that, does, that address um, additional concerns for specific diseases. It is like the other tools, computerized adaptive tests or short forms for each subdomain, and most scores can be linked to PROMISE. So um, looking forward, we really hope that um, these NIH measures toolbox, PROMISE toolbox and NeuroQual um, will be used in all of our funded clinical studies and extramurally, and we hope that they'll be adapted by many others as well. So, I think the take-home message is that precise valid measurement is possible without unduly burdening patients and that this is going to become part of the required repertoire of those people doing clinical research and particularly clinical trials. So um, I want to thank all of you for being here and for those of you, I hope, who are on uh, the video cast and hope you find the day um, and the use of these tools really useful. And I'm delighted to see David Goldstein here in the audience, one of our investigators. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So now we're going to move to the main portion of the program. And uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Richard Gershon. Uh, Richard is Associate Professor at the Medical uh, Social Sciences at Northwestern University. And uh, he has been leading the effort uh, in the development of the assessment center, the NIH toolbox, and he's, he's been also involved with the development of NeuroQual. And um, he's excited about uh, being here. He's eager to make this presentation, and he is a, it's a wonderful presentation, and he'll provide you with a wonderful introduction to these new tools, and uh, I think he can be an extremely persuasive speaker, and I'm sure you all feel very excited about uh, using the tools after you hear his presentation. Richard? Thanks, Susanna. I was beginning to think someone didn't want us to come. I think this is our third scheduled attempt. We were first snowed out by DC weather. We were then snowed out by Chicago weather. And I looked outside today, but uh, it seems like we're okay. So, uh. all right, I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna spend a fair amount of time right now talking about a few things. We're gonna talk about the commonality between these three sets of instruments. We're gonna talk about what the relevance is in clinical uh, uh, use. We're gonna talk about how they work. We're gonna talk about uh, how they measure up uh, compared to current instruments, and then we'll spend some time on 
uh, what instruments are available. I urge you to grab the, if you're uh, here, uh, copies of the uh, brochures and lists of instruments that uh, were out on the tables in the lobby, and most of those pieces are available uh, online as well. So I've been able to revise my slides three times for this presentation, which is the danger of being uh, rescheduled. But I, I was getting to think about what, what is going on? Why are these three sets of instruments together? And they're the same but different. And I think they each offer something unique. And I should point out they overlap quite a bit as well. So you're going to see I'm going to be able to talk a lot all the same. Promise. You've heard nice introductions to all of these. But I went back to the original documentation, the original offering documents, to say what, what was the original intent? And we heard from the people who were having these ideas close to a decade ago for the uh, uh, promise. But development has a large bank of items measuring PROs. Uh, this is a relatively uh, strange concept a decade ago. Now we talk about it, oh, we're doing this, we're doing that, we've got PCORI, we're using here and there, but really not, people weren't thinking in these terms. Up at the top, meet the needs of clinical researchers across a wide variety of chronic disorders and diseases. I should point out that that was the original goal. This is for research. And I will tell you today that all of these instrument batteries uh, are probably primarily the, the uh, scales have tipped and people are using them for clinical, direct clinical work as much, and that is rapidly growing, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Secondly, innovative idea, create a computerized adaptive testing system that allow us to do these things more quickly in, uh, in clinical research and make it publicly available. So there's a common repository of items and kits. That's definitely a foreign concept in measure development. It turns out that almost any instrument you use, uh, there's a little price tag associated with it, which has really reduced the desire to use these items in research and even further in clinical use. Toolbox, I should kind of overlay these. Develop an integrated set of measures, cognitive, emotional, motor, sensory, neural behavioral functioning, large cohort studies and clinical trials. Common currency, okay. Still kind of trying to get things that are used common across study designs. Maximize yield from large expensive studies with minimal increment in subject burden and cost. Underlying, we just almost a cut and paste, except adding now not just outcome measures, but outcome measures and objective measures. And NeuroQual, NeuroQual a little different. All that said and done, and a lot of these grew up in the same, I want to say that any relies on each other, but defining measures quality of life and neurological disorders, particularly adding in symptom specific areas that are really only found with patients with neurological disorders, core set of questions, chronic neurological diseases um, that may be specific to patients defined by disease age or other factors. So, all pretty similar sounding. Whoops. So, going under the covers, the 10 or 15 pages of these original RFAs, what was there? Intellectual property free, high up on the list. Psychometrically sound. Turns out a lot of measures used in research, and particularly clinically, if you go back and look at the measures we learned in residency and med school and anywhere, it turns out they very often are instruments that were never fully validated. They are not reliable. That doesn't mean that they're not used hundreds of thousands of times a day, but they're not the quality we would like. They certainly wouldn't pass the smell test for a new measure that's derived today. Scores are scaled. So you can have different types of tests on the same metric. Brief and easy to use, which turns out to be the major stumbling block slash the major goal of all this instrument work is how do you get these things short enough that people can use them? Applicable in a variety of settings, available for use across the age span, and all of them were, uh, should be generally translatable. And I should say that all of these instruments are already normed and validated in Spanish that we're talking about today, and many of them in dozens of other languages. So we're also going to talk about lots of different types of measures, uh, those that need to be given by computer or could be given by computer. And we can see here, uh, my little pointer here, we can give CATS computer adaptive tests. If you don't know what that is, you will by the time I step down from here. Uh, high level precision. Variable in length, four to 12 items. Uh, really seeing more like five or six items does the trick. 
Short forms can be given on computer or paper. Um, varies by length, and you can do a short form that matches your sample. So we need something It's very short. We can use it for a trial. Uh, then we can get the mean level of something, and that works. If I need something for clinical use, I can make it a little longer. And then full-length scale instrument. We, we still can do very long instruments. I think you're going to see we don't need them. Here are the three systems at a glance. Thank you to uh, uh, people from the NH putting this together. As you see, Promise was a common fund initiative. Started first commonly referred to as Promise 1, 2004 to 8. Promise 2, 2009 to 13. Cross disease, emphasis, self-report, a lot of domains, a lot of age ranges, over 40 languages at the moment, healthy people. NH Toolbox contract mechanism uh, released in this room October of uh, last year. Uh, performed self-report, 45 instruments, 3 to 85. And NeuroQual, another contract mechanism. Let's dive in. So the other piece forthcoming on this is uh, three systems. Uh, one. Research resources, a slide Bill Riley put together, uh, integrating these three measurement systems to, with the goal of non-NH direct support, um, that will support the infrastructure and scientific standards and facilitate data harmonization. Uh, more on that as we learn. So, whoops. All right, public but private. And I was, uh, Bill Riley and I spoke with the HHS interagency measurement selection team, I don't know what the official name is, uh, two weeks ago, and the biggest shock I heard was, well, we're not looking at these instruments because they cost too much. I got to put right up at the top, there is zero direct cost, there are zero royalties for any of the measurement systems that I'm presented today. Okay, there's no per test cost, and depending on the format, you have no cost to do them, otherwise how you put them together. There are revenue neutral fees for technology only for those people who want to access central technology. So for instance, we put a, a part of a, the reason for today is in announcing that we have a, a server based here at the clinical center for use for um, intramural research and there's no cost to use that. These are open access tools for research, clinical use and education. Um, but there are restrictions for ex where exposure would negate the value of the instruments. For instance, for instance, the NH Toolbox Cognition Battery, if that was fully put out there in the public, uh, public domain, then people would practice it at home, the scores would have less use to them. Let's talk about a little bit computer adaptive testing, or CAT. Um, for the instruments in here, most of the uh, instruments that we have, most of PRO, Patient Report Outcome Measures, and Promise, Miracle, and Toolbox are based on using CAT. We also use CAT for dichotomous type items. Those are answers with a right or wrong decision, such as vocabulary and reading in the NIH toolbox. And we just use item response theory on its own for scoring things such as picture sequence memory and balance again. So how does item response theory differ from conventional test theory? Well, we all learn conventional test theory somewhere along the way. Probably first time we took a test in second grade. Um, you know, we added up the scores. We got a grade. Uh, that sounded good. An individual takes an assessment. We take a look at their total score. We use that for comparison purposes. A high score, a person's higher on that trait. A low score, a person's lower on the trait. Makes sense, except if you're the person who in eighth grade had the really hard teacher and their 80% was really like a 99% in the other class because very often tests are not comparable. If we just add up the scores, that doesn't mean they have the same difficulty. Item response theory looks at life in a different way. Each individual item can be used for comparison purposes. It's kind of like each item is its own test. If you endorse harder items, you're higher on the trait. If you endorse easier, lower items, you're lower on that trait. But we can aggregate these items together to get a longer test. If you don't follow that, it's okay. Give me a few minutes. I don't know. We're... Okay, so the promise of NH instruments, and not just promise instruments, comparability, provide the ability to compare combined results from multiple studies, reliability and validity, reducing response burden, also improving measurement precision. The irony. It, typically, a test is most reliable when it's long. It's usually it's the assessment creator secret. 
put more items in front of a person, you get a more reliable test. What we show, we're able to show with all these instruments are that's not true. And indeed, sometimes more items tells you less. Simplify, simplify administration via computer-based administration, scoring, and reporting. There are non-computer-based forms of a lot of the assessments that I'm presenting today. Um, but if you use the computer-based forms, the last keystroke that a patient, a subject takes, the instrument is fully scored. And uh, depending on what instrument is, a normative score is available immediately. So let's talk about reliability or precision. This is the promise physical functioning instruments, a comparison of different instrument types. Orienting to this slide is always a little bit of a challenge, but here goes. You have on the left here standard error. We typically want as low an error as we can. Error relates, oh, if you can see under here, to reliability. So this line right here, very difficult to see, white on white, uh, you know, indicates a level with a reliability of 95, if you're more familiar with that metric, and the line up here, 90. What we've learned over time is, is that classic test theory says an instrument has one level of reliability no matter who you give it to. But that can't possibly be true. Let's think about that. If I have a fourth grade vocabulary test, it's highly reliable. How can I have the same level of reliability if I give it to kindergartners or eighth graders? Same thing applies to pain or depression. Cannot be the same across there. And item response theory is able to tease this out. So we can see here that different instruments have different, <laughs> okay have different ranges of reliability associated with them. So, you know, if we, uh, what is here? here? So this is a promise 20 item short form. We actually don't, nobody uses that one, but you can see if it's there, it's highly reliable in a range uh, from below the mean of the general, US general population, down pretty darn low. Up here, I believe we have the SF36 uh, physical function component. You see it does a very good job below the, 90, below the 95 reliability level for this very narrow range right here. What's the danger of using an instrument whose reliability is only strong in a certain area? You actually can't track progress, right? You can get an accurate assessment of your patient today when they're in a clinical range. But if you truly, if they truly go through improvement, these instruments, the instruments that don't have continuing reliability out to a higher end, don't I accurately identify a patient who's improved, okay? And so you can do a trial. Your trial shows no improvement, and I'll show you an example of this in a minute, and indeed, this person has continued to improve. It's the instrument you're using to assess that that hasn't caught it. Another one, fatigue. Now you can see the four item SF36 vitality scale really just touches at the 90 reliability level, okay, but only for people slightly, uh, who are slightly fatigued. The four item CAT hits the 90 level almost for uh, 70, 80% of the trait range. And if you wanna use a 13 item fast fatigue or 13 item CAT, you can get below the 95 level, this blue line down here is if you gave 90 items. I've always said you don't really want to give 90 fatigue items because you'll definitely be tired by the time you're done. Let's talk about validity. So scores on all these NIH measures should correlate with accepted measures of the same domain. Concurrent validity, creating these tests, if they don't relate to gold standard tests that we use all day long, then there's something going on that's wrong. So, Oops, now I'm nervous. <laughs> this was a slide I revised. Okay, we can still see it. This is an anxiety, and we're gonna orient you here. The first thing to notice is, so this compares promise anxiety versus the mask, commonly used instrument. Oh, let's see here. I'm always afraid of laser pointers. I'm gonna point at my own eyes. Okay, so this is good. This means the instruments are highly correlated, right? A score on one measure relates to score on the other measure. That's good, we wanna see that. For those of you who haven't looked at this, this is very good correlations. Um, but the story that's going on that's a little bit more disturbing is here. The mask has a significant floor effect, okay? It does not distinguish the majority of people in this sample that it was measured with. 
Okay, we do not know, we can't distinguish people at one end of the scale. Promise, on the other hand, it's got a little bit of a floor effect, but is able to differentiate people across 90 some odd percent of the trait range. Let's look at one more. Depression. Similarly, comparing promise depression to the CESD. When we started this project, you actually had to pay to use the CESD. Now you can get it for free. So that, that uh, part is gone here. But again, look what's going on. The CESD, again, has a strong effect. It does not cover people in this range. And the, other, and the promise depression covers across the entire range of the trait. Other things, when people experience clinical benefit or decline, their promise scores or any scores should change responsiveness. I don't think I go that into detail. Okay, what's computerized adaptive testing? Several of the NIH directors who up here mention this. It's shorter, it's targeted, and it uses a computerized algorithm. We haven't figured out how to do computerized adaptive testing without the computer, but we'll work on it. When I showed this slide uh, a decade ago, uh, these same groups were up here, but they were some of the only groups in the country who were using CAT. Um, so in PROs, CATs at the beginning of these contracts and grants were bleeding edge. Uh, in PROs, they were not bleeding edge in the world. Army, which I'm now happy to say also uses the Promise Instruments, but Army originally, probably the first group to use CATs in wide scale in the world, was for the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery, the ASVAB. Uh, they give this over a million times a year, primarily to high school students, to differentiate their ability and what kind of roles they could play in the armed services. They use CAT to be able to zero in on a person's ability level and also for security, something we don't tend to worry about in PROs. Because it's a computer-generated exam, we can make certain no two applicants uh, see the same items. And because of that, uh, recruiters for the Army who get compensation based on how many people they bring in lose their ability to tell people what all the answers are to the test in advance. Graduate record exam is given every day of the year via computer adaptive testing. It significantly cuts test length and again for security. National Association of Security Dealers, National Council of State Boards of Nursing. Uh, nurses up until eight, nine years ago took a 12-hour exam. It was offered twice a year. It cost about two and a half million dollars to produce that exam. For those of you who took it then, versus now, the exam averages about 90 minutes. It is given every day of the year, every weekday of the year. It is more reliable in its hour and a half format than it was in the 12 hour format. And by the way, in nursing it was quite a problem. Congress actually asked the nurse, uh, National Association of State Boards of Nursing to figure out a way to give tests more often. It originally, this was based upon when there were big nursing shortages about a decade ago. We were importing nurses from all over the world because we couldn't produce enough here. Even when we got people here, if you were busy on an emergency room shift that day, you had to wait another six months to get tested. I see a few nurses nodding their heads here. Okay, so let's talk about CAT of different ways. I'm gonna need two volunteers. You can stay in your seats. This always bothers me because the first person, I need somebody who can count to seven or eight or nine. This is no better than any MD group I go to. Thank you very much. One person in the room can count. Um, and I need somebody else who can answer simpler questions than that, just a person who's going to be able to guess. Thank you. Okay, so I need you to pick a number between 1 and 100. 57. No, I don't need you to tell me the number. Okay. <laughs> Let's get another volunteer. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, pick another number, don't tell me. Okay, great. And you're going to count how many questions it takes me to figure out that he picked 57. Oh, no, whatever number it's going to be. Okay, so is your number greater than 50? Now I'm getting nervous. Okay, is it less than 75? Is it less than 67? Is it greater than 56? Uh, let's step in. Is it greater than 61? Is it greater than 64? Is it 65? Is it 66? 
How many questions? Eight. I made a mistake in here. I should be able to get it in seven, but uh, okay. That's effectively how a cat works. Let's see how a classical test works. Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? While I have a lot of time, I probably don't have enough time, particularly if it's a paper-based test, I'd have to hand out a sheet with 100 true-false questions, bring that sheet back, add up my scores, and find out I'm at 66. What, hap what did I do? The first question, is it greater than 50? Yes. I just cut my test length in half, right? I just eliminated 50 questions. Next question, is less than 75? Yes. I just cut my test length. I know it's between 50 and 75. I just reduced my test length by 75 questions in two questions. That's the basis of computer adaptive testing. It's the basis of a lot of the tests we're about to show. Because once I knew that person's above 50, I don't need to ask them about their questions at 10 and 20 and 30 and 40. Once I know a person's pain is low, why do I ask them seven to 20 more times, how bad was your pain this morning? How bad was it yesterday? And conversely, when the person first says, this pain interfere with daily activities, never, why is it that in any standardized instrument I ask another seven to 20 times, so how bad was it this morning? How bad was it yesterday? How bad is when you do things? It's a waste of patient effort. It's a waste of burn. Frankly, it frustrates patients and subjects as well. So CAT starts with an item bank. An item bank is a, a group of items that cover the whole range of the trait. So indeed, if I want to assess pain, I need items in there on people with really severe pain, pain that's completely interruptive to their lives. I also need questions in there that deal with almost no pain or no pain, bothers me a little bit, et cetera. I want them a whole way. And then I have to calibrate these items. And I calibrate items by understanding where they fall on that difficulty range and how well they discriminate. It turns out some items do a better job than others at determining if it's above 50. If life was so simple that it was a clear cut greater than 50, less than 75, uh, wouldn't take so much effort. So let's take uh, credit to Karen Cook here. I usually never show her slides while she's in the room, so I have to uh, do this. Okay, let's take physical functioning. Okay, so we have an item bank. Okay, these are items. We have a, a range of the trait. We have people for physical functioning that are basically bed bound. They have very, very little physical functioning. And we have people who are uh, highly active physically. Turns out that almost every single physical functioning instrument that's used clinically stops right about here. I always thought that was pretty good. We did a really good job of measuring here, but it turns out we started working, uh, uh, Dr. Rothrock, uh, uh, with a group with um, orthopedic trauma surgeons. And they say, wait a minute, our patients are physically active. When we treat them, or they're sports stars, or they're they, they marathon runners, when we treat them and our current instrument takes them to completely cured right here, they don't feel completely cured. They need to know that they got back up to this level. We're also, Dr. Cook and I are working with the Department of Defense. They're saying, okay, that's great you got them to hear. They want to know, we need to differentiate if they can hike 50 miles or if they can hike 50 miles carrying a back pack on their back. Still working on that one. So we can set a ruler across this range and we can find items that accurately place people or that are located, centered in this range. So an item that's applicable to someone's bed-bound level of physical functioning is clearly going to be different than an item that's associated with somebody who has a very high level of physical functioning. This is our CAD algorithm, letting you know. So we have a person of unknown level of physical functioning. Our CAD algorithm typically is going to look for an item in the middle of this trait range. Why is it doing that? It's similar to that question I asked before. Is your number greater or less than 50? Why did I pick 50? Because it's going to give me the greatest idea, am I looking high or am I looking low? If I knew this person was in a clinical setting, I could actually start down here. But for our purposes right now, we're going to say we don't know anything about this person. We're going to give this person this item. 
Turns out they're an active soccer player. They've got some, you know, they're going to have a higher level of physical functioning. So our CAD algorithm is going to next pull an item at the higher end of the scale. It's going to skip down here. And I assure you, any off-the-shelf physical functioning measure of general ability, the next question is here, and the next question is here, and the next question is here, and this person has absolutely no idea why you're asking them these questions about their limited physical functioning. So we're going to continue to give items in this range. There will be a test on this algorithm at the end. Um, we perform little maximum likelihood calculus in the background. What's going on? We do two things after every item is given. We calculate our best estimate of the person's ability level, in this case ability being physical functioning, but ability could also be their depression level or their uh, anxiety level or their vocabulary level. From my perspective, they're almost all the same math, they're little, a couple minor changes. Um, so we get our best idea of their level of functioning, and we're also able to calculate how accurate we believe we know that. Every single item gives us information about the reliability of their measurement. And thirdly, then we're going to go out and seek and find the item that's going to tell us the most about this person, given what we know about them. Because even this person right here, okay, is not the person with a 50-pound pack on. So they could be an active weekend soccer player, but they're not on the Olympic team. So we're going to continue giving items. Next, let's take another person. While we physically can see, we visually see that they probably have a lower level of functioning, we can give them the same test. We give them an item in the middle of the trait range. Based on their answer to the first item, we're going to go low on the range this time. We're not going to ask them about how often, how many miles they ran this week. We're not going to ask them questions which to them seem quite silly. Now let's look at both of these people at the same time. So what did we do? We knew where their ability loves approximately within the first item. Within one or two items, we have a pretty good idea of where they're located. For every successive item, we narrow down our estimate of their ability, the nest estimate of their functioning. All tests are estimate of functioning. We all know this. Heck, even white blood counts have some level of accuracy associated with them, the things we consider to be objective. But in this case, we know it, we can quantify it. Now, if I'm doing a study, uh, a trial, comparing the efficacy of a drug, I might in two or three items be done. Because if I average 100 people with this level of error in them, I'm going to be able to very accurately sense change. But if I want to use my assessment of this person to change their own clinical treatment right now, I might take this on a little bit, give them a slightly longer exam. In the case of a cat, we're now talking about four or five items instead of two or three, and move to get a highly reliable measure of their functioning. So when do we stop? We can stop at a specified number of items. We can say, look, enough's enough. Or we can stop at a, a specified level of precision. And that level of precision can be defined based on what your need is. Again, it's a different level of need if you're just trying to compare two groups than if you're trying to individually look at a current patient's level of functioning. So why bother? I'm grimacing because I <laughs> early slide said. OK, reduce the burden of responding and make room for measuring other domains. You're going to see today, I'm going to show you quite literally about 200 instruments. Don't worry, we won't go too, too deep a dive. When people start giving these, and Promise started deriving different measures, it turned out people really wanted to give people six or seven. Now, in the at minimum, in the old way of looking at things, the old paradigms, you know, the standard Fatigue instrument could have been 70 items. You gave six of those, you're at 360 items. You had a person sitting in that waiting room for an hour. Heck, they would never finish the instruments. They'd rarely volunteer to be in the study. We now have numerous clinical uses of these instruments going on. The average promise instrument, for instance, can be given in under a minute. And we're going to see we have similar proportionate level of being able to shorten assessments for all the instruments we're talking about. So. Here's Promise, Promise website. 
What does Promise have? Promise was a cooperative group, 13 research sites, three centers, 150 scientists over time, over 100 peer-reviewed publications. This is not bleeding edge. This is real. These are publications across the gamut from disease-specific to method studies, things like that. Uh, from an informatics perspective, we have both assessment center, which we'll talk about in a lot more detail in about an hour, um, as well as Firestar, which is a simulation engine. This has 40 adult measures and 20 pediatric measures. I assure you there's more than that. The count is uh, there are new instruments in uh, specific areas literally coming out weekly. All items in Spanish, uh, individual banks and instruments in many languages. Non-disease specific. Oh, I see what I'm doing here. OK. Why PROs provide patient-centered perspective to understand how pa treatments affect patient experiences, symptoms, functions, participation, quality of life. Honestly, talking about PROs 10 years ago, people thought, mm, OK, that's nice. Don't need to deal with that. Well, today, cannot get a drug approved without showing an improvement in, an in a patient-reported outcome measure. You are going to have you know, PCORI. You, you're not uh, meaningful use says you've got to show that patients think they're better. You cannot biologically treat a person, repair them, and have them feel worse at the end. Okay, that is not the definition of successful treatment today. Okay, we can use it to uh, augment designs of patient-centered treatment plans and improve patient-provider communication and better manage that chronic disease. As a time with the face-to-face -face patient time decreases, it's all the more important that we can rapidly find out what's going on with the patient, have they changed in certain areas, flag areas. These things can be taken at home, they can be taken in the waiting room, they can be inserted into electronic medical record, and they can be used to help augment a physician in treatment. People who use these sorts of instruments in the way I just described find it decreases, it does not increase the amount of time in the clinician encounter. It focuses and says, person who says quickly, um, no, my depression's fine, my fatigue's fine, that's great, until you chart their promise score and it's going up or down and they're not sensing it, they're not telling you, they don't think it's important, they're much more concerned with their wound dressing and it may take a visit or two for a clinician to realize, no, that's not all that's going on. These measures help you do that. Um, we assess outcomes and experiences known only to the patient, depression, fatigue, pain. The clinical model, what people are trained in medical school, is that the physician knows all these things about their patients. We know their level of depression, we know their fatigue, we know their pain. Somehow in our 6.5 minute clinical encounter, we know all that. A, I don't think we ever did, but B, we don't have time to drill down. We don't have that half an hour to chat with every patient what's going on. This helps get to it. And pr provides a, a precise measure of things that are difficult to obtain via other measures. We can't, let's talk about physical functioning. Yes, you could send somebody for a consult. We can measure all sorts of things using objective equipment. We could take long surveys. But in the end, the, a simple four item promised physical functioning measure is going to get at a generalized look at their level of physical functioning, which we learned in study after study, clinical population after clinical population, is going to correlate in the 90s with traditional measures in a fraction of the time. So why promise? More precise outcomes, internet item response theory, rigorous item development, uh, the uh, Several hundred scientists in, involved in this set very high standards for themselves before starting their work. They publish papers in advance what level of uh, validity, reliability is important to have. Uh, a lot more, a more efficient item administration using banking, computer adaptive testing, making all this publicly available. Generic tools that can be administered across disease groups. Hoping my next slides here. And tools that provide a common metric. So thanks to Bill Riley, many instruments, but one metric. Let's take the case of blood pressure. The definition of blood pressure, right, is based on mercury readings. How many of you are using mercury-based to measure blood pressure today, right? We don't, and yet we still cite the same common metric 
across using new measurement types. So we can use outcomes such as PROMISE and the other instruments actually as well in clinical use in the hospital and clinical practice in clinical research both by the NIH, industry, FDA, and in things like surveys such as the CDC. Brief history of PROMISE, we heard a little bit before, but initially a roadmap initiative. So develop and evaluate PROs, complete, create computer adaptive testing, and disseminate to clinical researchers. Then a uh, subsequent grant to six research sites and coordinating statistical coordinating centers, uh, I'm sorry, under PROMISE 1, five core domains, pain, fatigue, emotional distress, physical functioning, and social well-being. Promise 2, coming to a close right now, added a lot of research sites, additional centers, uh, a lot of validation, and a lot of different diseases. Whoops. Promise funding has been fairly significant, and it's been dollars well spent, I'm not, I'm not aware of a study that didn't find some improvement using a PROMISE measure that was funded by the NIH. PROMISE domain framework. Uh, this is available in miniature form in the little one-page brochure. I would urge you go to nhpromise.org online um, and do a deep dive. Uh, so here's a generalized framework. We have measures of global health. Very fast instruments get a, a, a quick snapshot of a person's health. Otherwise, we have numerous instruments roughly under the umbrella of physical health, mental health, and social health, dealing with things like symptoms, function, et cetera. So let's go in. Promise basic profile banks. Okay, so people very often come to us and say, okay, I want the promise. We don't really refer to it as the promise, but I know there's a person who's looking for something. And typically we say, okay, if you're looking for a short set of measures, a short set of domains that will help and uh, can be helpful in research, that generally applicable to many diseases, um, take something from the profile banks. Now, I don't know what to do here because I've got the wrong set of slides up here, but so a slide that I had up here that I should have had was produced by Medicare, CMS, and was presented at a core meeting a few months ago. And it showed that there is no such thing, or less than half of their patients only have a single disease. So we can use a single disease-based measure all we want, and it can make us feel good, but the reality is that's not the patient's experience. So when we're measuring fatigue, if we do a fatigue base for this condition they have, and another one for that condition they have, we're not getting at the patient. We're getting at what looks good in our research papers. So we, there's really a necessity to have instruments that are cross diseases because it's a rare patient who's only measured in the one area. And unfortunately, the majority of research on assessment measures to date outside of PROMISE have been, hey, how does this instrument that we created for this disease work? I remember being at my first International Society of Quality Life Research conference. There were 40, I, I went through the program, there were 40 different fatigue measures used, sponsored by the NIH. 40 different fatigue measures, this is prior to promise, sponsored the NIH. And they were fatigue for this, fatigue for that. By the way, the items in fatigue measures overlap a lot, but they said this is the fatigue for blank, blank disease. I won't pick on any one, there were 40 of them at the time. And I was struck at the time with two things. One is, they're not comparable. And secondly, when we look, look at it relative to CMS, it's kind of silly. And if you look at the research studies, and anyone who's done this say, okay, we're gonna do it in this disease, and we're going to not include anybody who has any other condition. And then we find over time, though, well, we get rid of a half to two-thirds of the people we see in our clinic because they have more than one condition. And so what PROMISE says is it doesn't matter which condition they have. We can take this instrument, we can use it across conditions. So physical functioning, we talked a little bit about that. Paint intensity, that's good. Uh, <laughs> paint intensity, paint interference, we'll leave uh, Karen to, uh, I think Karen got into my slides here. Okay, I'm, not, I'm never gonna leave that one down. Okay, uh, fatigue and sleep disturbance, depression and anxiety. Uh, when people come in, I very often say, do you know a person's level of depression? It's very hard to get a patient to say that uh, their treatment was successful if they have depression. And if you're a surgeon 
and your out rating outcome from that patient is did not do a good job, you, you really want to know what this person's mental health is, where they're at, because it really makes no difference. If a person's very depressed or very anxious, the, what you did to them medically is really not going to matter. And then satisfaction with participation in social roles. Promise Plus. These are additional instruments available in each of these areas to do a deeper dive. Pain behavior, sleep-related impairment, a series of instruments on sexual functioning. Obviously, a lot of these instruments are more or less important depending on the type of disease you're looking at. Mental health, we can actually do more, uh, uh, dive in deeper, anger, applied cognition, various uh, alcohol instruments, uh, psychosocial illness impact, how is illness impacting um, uh, psychological conditions, and then in social health, um, ability to participate, social support. A lot of diseases, if a person doesn't have adequate support going on, they don't get better. Or if they do get better, their recidivism is incredibly high. If they don't have a support system outside, you can have done a great job. They're still going to show back up in the emergency room and back for additional treatment. These are instruments, again, available all in versions under a minute. You can get, you can track this over time. You can use it as a, a variable when beginning to treat a patient. You can use it as an outcome measure. And a lot of additional measures, I put them under the unofficial categorization of extras. Upper extremity versus mobility. These are subsets of the physical functioning scale. You know, if indeed you broke your leg, it, it turns out the physical functioning measure on its own does a pretty good job for people regardless they broke their leg or they broke their arm. It deals, it's a generalized measure, but we have more targeted instruments for those people who think they need it. Mobility, asthma, GI, self-efficacy, disease control, peer relationships, et cetera. Lots and lots of targeted instruments that very often can take the replacement of something existing or provide additional instruments that can be used. In pediatrics, this is just a sampling. There have been uh, significant efforts, primarily focused at uh, UNC and at CHOP, uh, of bringing either pediatric equivalents to many of the PROMISE instruments, as well as uh, instruments for proxy measures by parents of children's functioning. Neuroqual. Uh, contract mechanism had five primary research sites. 12 publications to date, so much smaller effort. Also run through assessment center. You're going to find a common thread here is, is that we created all of these on a common technology platform. So if you can run one of these, you can run uh, all or almost all of these, and that's what we've set up in the clinical center now. Uh, item banks, 14 adult domains, 8 pediatric domains. If, if a domain was the same as a domain covered by Promise, and we'll say later with a toolbox, they're not different instruments. They're the same with validation within the clinical sample, but very often there's some symptom-specific issues are different. They've all been translated, validated in Spanish. In this case, as opposed to Promise, they really are targeted at neurological conditions, and there are some specific uh, symptoms, in particular neurological conditions, that are just not applicable to general population. We can't, cer certain things just don't f go across. Generalized NeuroQual domain framework, self-reported health again, roughly divided among physical, mental, and social health. Uh, symptoms, function, emotional health. Let's see, a little deeper dive here. So in physical health for adults, fatigue, sleep disturbance, et cetera. But we get into some areas that are more uh, applicable, bowel, bladder function, not things that are typically going to come in your cross-study research. Um, uh, pediatric, uh, greater concern about uh, pain in areas of the body. Mental health, adding communication, end-of-life concerns, not something you're probably going to ask of every patient. But if you have a serious disease, those uh, instruments are there, and you see some of these stigma. Again, now we're looking at certain tra uh, domains that may not be applicable in certain disease areas. And in social health, ability to participate, um, interactions with adults for pediatrics, again, additional areas uh, that may be useful in research or clinically. NH Toolbox, 80 institutions, 256 scientists, 20,000 subjects. 54 peer-reviewed publications that actually went up by a dozen this week with the uh, electronic release in the Journal of International and Neurological Society. Um, do, do, do. Informatics again by Assessment Center. It's toolbox a little bit different. We'll get into it. Um, it was designed to have 40, four, 40, four 30 minute domain batteries. It has been fully normed for ages 3 to 85. A lot of supplemental instruments, 108 instruments in all. In those areas, again, it, particularly in uh, emotion, that uh, 
matched promise domains, promise was utilized, all Spanish, again, designed to be non-disease specific, validated in many diseases, and that works ongoing. Cognition domain framework uh, created, disease, uh, created diseases, created instruments in six primary areas. I'm gonna run through these kind of quickly. Uh, set shifting tax, you'll see that this, dom this 30 minute is a domain battery, probably re replaces a three hour uh, neuropsych evaluation. The cognition uh, toolbox had uh, also wanted to be short, but short meant a battery in under 30 minutes. There are no instruments in cognition. The, these instruments take uh, two to five minutes, uh, but they replace instruments that take 15 to 30 minutes, and that requires somebody with large degree of practice or a large with a degree period, and these do not. Um, we have executive functioning tasks, um, site shifting. They've validated against uh, NANDIS examiner dot count, children's behavior questionnaire, working memory, similar to the Weschler letter number sequencing and the uh, PSAT test, uh, an episodic memory test, uh, memorize a sequence, should be shown a sequence of events, scramble them up on the screen and retake them, uh, uh, validate against the Ray Vault, uh, several instruments there, okay, language, uh, a computer adaptive vocabulary test, uh, validating it's a PPVT, four minutes, uh, self-guided, uh, to get a highly accurate measured person's vocabulary ability, a nice proxy for general IQ, uh, valid against Peabody and the, and the rat. Oral reading recognition, good measure, uh, again, valid against the rat, three minute test of oral reading recognition. Processing speed, are things the same or not? Uh, uh, valid against the Weschler processing speed test. Again, 90 second test, highly reliable. Again, we can do that because it's computer administered. Motor domain framework, another set of objective measures now, not self-report measures. So dexterity, uh, the team utilized um, uh, traditional pegboard. So the, the goal was always not to create something from scratch. If something out there existed that was inexpensive and brief, use it. Strength, using a uh, grip strength dynamometer. Uh, interesting thing is, post the toolbox uh, validation and norming exercise, this manufacturer asked if they could switch their norms to the NH toolbox norms because they were better than the norms that uh, they published. Balance test. Uh, at the time this was created, this test replaced a $100,000 piece of equipment. A person's wearing a gate belt. It sends 15,000 pieces of information to a computer via Bluetooth about postural and anterior sway. Uh, it's on that gate belt, our sensorometers, um, and get a, a uh, highly accurate sense of uh, uh, balance. Uh, locomotion, uh, using a gate speed test. Um, endurance, this team, that's interesting, uh, someone mentioned earlier a four minute, six minute walk. This team said we can make it shorter they validated a two-minute walk test. Correlates in the mid-90s with a six-minute, which say, that's not, a, that's, what'd we do that for? Well, six minutes to two minutes is a lot when you're assessing a lot of different areas. Sensation domains. Hearing, uh, a word and noise test, as well as a hearing threshold test and hearing handicapped inventory, which is a self-report measure. Visual spatial test, this looks like there's something on the, on the wall here. This is a test given by computer screen and it's a computer adaptive test zeroing in on a person's um, a visual acuity level. There are different versions here for young kids uh, versus older adults. And a supplemental vision related quality of life, VRQOL. This is really looking at the NEI VFQ and making it shorter and cover more domains. Dynamic visual acuity. Um, it's really another balance test. It's ability to do head rotations while walking, while doing other things. And this person's wearing this little kind of funny looking headset on. It takes four minutes or so, but it's able, you're, you're moving your head back and forth. Can you recognize stimuli? How long does it take to recognize stimuli off the side of your eyes? It's a very important uh, measure of being able to walk. Odor identification test. Standard odor identification test costs uh, between $12 and $30. Uh, came up with a set of scratch and sniff cards. They're available now from two manufacturers online for $1.50. Uh, so there is some cost somewhere here. And it's a test where a person has a little scratch and sniff and they're given items to identify. A lot of correlates with things like Parkinson's disease, uh, diseases where the olfactory sense 
um, can be used to, uh, uh, as a marker relative to a lot of neurological functioning, spatial taste test, um, pain interference measure adopted as sensation here in the NH toolbox. Migrant came from Promise originally. Um, NH toolbox has its own emotion domain framework. I'm not going to dive too deeply here, but these instruments are, uh, uh, there's a, a fair amount of overlap with Promise, but then the, the emphasis here was on health. Now, health and disease typically take up the same trait continuum, but so there are additional instruments that were added here, positive social development, uh, instruments that full, further expand uh, what's available. I should point out that getting accurate scores in all of these areas, generally speaking, the toolbox took about 12 minutes. Okay, so 12 minutes, uh, and we will be releasing new algorithms for both the toolbox and Promise, perhaps NeuroQual, later this year, we're finding that we can, uh, our, our longer tests were based on people who were so far away that the instruments didn't cover them. Even, the, even though I showed you before, Promise has fewer floor effects, there are still those people at the very end, and we can actually cut their test length by quite a bit. Another related effort is Prosetta Stone. Uh, Presetta Stone was an effort to look at existing Promise instruments as well as uh, Toolbox and NeuroQual and say, how do these instruments relate to existing instruments? I've been collecting data for a decade. I have all of these blank scores. And if I switch these instruments, is all, do I throw all that away? And the answer is no, you don't need to. Maybe you could see this. I can barely see it. What's happened is, is that Prop, the Prosetta Stone effort has gone ahead and given things like the CESD and the Promise Measure to hundreds or thousands of individuals and created lookup tables that say, I have a score on the CESD, how does it relate to a score on a Promise Measure? This enables you to, if you've been using the old scores, you can bring them forward, you can take the Promise scores, you can go backwards, you can compare to other studies. The other thing that it really brings forward is there's clearly a lot deeper uh, uh, history of research in the CESD. What are clinical cutoffs? What do we think we do there? If we can match the scores in the CESD to promise, we can see that traditionally, clinically, with this score on CESD, we would enact this type of treatment. So we can migrate that research to be utilized with Promise as well. There's a growing number of instruments that are covered this way. Each, any instrument that's covered by Prosetta Stone has a technical paper associated with it, and you can look up various scores. Okay, so clinical use of Promise is expanding quite rapidly. Uh, you are not the first here at the clinical center. Uh, Cleveland Clinic has been utilizing the Promise measures, I want to say, for four or five years now, as computer adaptive testing format. Uh, Northwestern has had in its uh, Gynonc Clinic uh, assessing patients as they're waiting in the waiting room. Uh, UCLA, DOD Task Painforth, I'll leave that for Karen to get into, but doing quite a bit. Um, John Hopkins, NCAM, uh, Stanford. I should, talk, I should talk about EPIC for a few minutes. Uh, EPIC has had Promise short forms uh, available for a little bit over a year. Uh, and a uh, few of us spent a day there a couple of weeks ago. And I'm happy to report that Epic, by the end of this year, will have, should have all the Promise short forms from all the instruments available, as well as IRT based scoring. Right now, there's lookup based scoring. It'll have the IRT scoring, which gives you a little bit more accurate assessment. And then so they've said, but they also admit there are no promises when Epic's going to release something. Uh, by 2016, they will have all the CATs available as well, all the computer adaptive tests available directly. So any user of Epic will be able to just pick from a dropdown and include uh, promise scores, or results of promise assessments in clinical assessment in the clinical workflow. Because I believe in clinical use, ultimately, the use of all these instruments will mean, uh, will really be, uh, be forwarded better when instruments are inserted in the normal clinical workflow and the normal technology in the EMR you're using every day. We're not, but by use of having the server within the clinical center, we're not quite there yet, but at least gives you access. Longer on, it should just be click off. Here's my orders. Whenever I see a patient like this, I click this, this, and this, and that'll come up. We're still working on that here. Uh, Saskin, by the way, is a group I should point out. They're out of India. They, um, they work on custom 
EMRs around the world, people who, need, who customize an EMR for treatment, they have also made the promised cats available to institutions who want to do that. Orthopedics is an area that is uh, really taken off with promise instruments. Um, and uh, part of the reason is that orthopedics has had a really long-standing tradition of the voice of the patient. And they've also had the funding to be able to look at new things. They've had their own instruments. And they're rapidly switching to promise instruments. They realize they, they're, they're self-made instruments. Uh, promise does a better job than the instrument developed for X, Y, or Z. Uh, groups such as out of Harvard, University of Utah, uh, is installing a promise server right now, AO Foundation. Um, uh, the orthopedic trauma group we talked about by, before. American Organization of Foot and Ankle Surgeons is undergoing a pilot project to have anybody who's applying for foot and ankle surgery certification to collect promise instruments from their patients. So to be certified, or particularly recertified, you'll have to have X number of your patients fill out promise instruments and indicate that they see a change. They're not just going to certify because you can answer a multiple choice test. They're going to certify you based on the fact that your patients feel that you've helped them. American Board of Orthopedic Surgeons, which is the giant grandfather of all these groups, is undergoing a similar pilot right now as well. Tell me more. Um, we've got assessment center installed here at NIH Clinical Center for Intramural Research. It provides uh, ready access for the Promise instruments, NeuroQual, uh, most of the toolbox instruments. Uh, some of the toolbox instruments we'll talk about or we're waiting to see uh, feedback from you, what is needed, what's there. But uh, they're centered here. There's a server here. The server here means the data is here. The assessment center that we run for extramural research last year gave 600, was used to conduct 650 studies around the world off a single server based at Northwestern. Uh, that's good for our management. It's good to make things readily available. It's not so good if you have an institution, you have federal guidelines for keeping your data behind your own clinical firewall, which is why we're excited about EPIC. We're excited about the server being here at the clinical center. You can use it here. Your data never leaves. There's no communication back to Northwestern. It's all here. Uh, we don't do it. We, we also have offline and API options. Uh, API is an application programming interface. It is uh, something we created as a one-off project for fun one day, and it turns out it's uh, being rapidly asked for. And it's the ability to take all of Promise, NeuroQual, particularly Toolbox, emotional health instruments in a piece, a little library with all the algorithms, hand it to a group and say, you've got an existing EMR, just take this bit of code, put it on your server, you can serve up your own instruments. You don't have to use our whole big assessment center, you can just directly build it into what you're doing. Um, in places such as University of Utah are putting it there. Um, Epic will use this to access instruments, et cetera. Um, very excited, Epic. I thought that was going to make my month for some reason, and a lot of uh, thanks to mem various members of the Promise Steering Committee in particular. Uh, by the way, we approached Ep Red, uh, EPIC about five years ago. Originally, they said we were never going to have PROs in EPIC. Uh, we've gone to that to them asking us to come out to help them implement CATS, so forever's, never say forever. I've learned that a long time ago. Uh, REDCAP. Uh, REDCAP is currently, REDCAP added uh, cats on a pilot basis and the short forms a couple of years ago. Pretty clunky. I'm sorry, the short forms not clunky. They're there. People have been using them thousands of times, hundreds of studies. Um, but REDCap right now is um, pilot testing the, the full use of that API, all promise instruments, short forms and cats, neuroqual instruments, and toolbox emotional health instruments, and the other self report instruments. Um, hoping will be available to any REDCap institution internally. So again, data stored inside in one of the 900 servers that REDCap runs around the world by the end of the calendar year. And that means if you have colleagues in Japan and China and the Netherlands and Europe, they will have the capability of running those instruments internally on their academic based server. And uh, 2015 iPad apps, I should say that actually Monday of this week, the National Children's Study uh, trained People for the Vanguard study, those are the 40 centers. I don't know if you're familiar with the National Children's Study. Eventually, 100,000 uh, participants. Right now, a 5,000 person study across 40 uh, randomly selected counties in the United States. And they actually train their field workers on Monday of how to use the iPad version, so a tablet version of the NH Toolbox cognition instruments for uh, three year olds. 
a very cute video, which we might actually show in a minute. Um, okay, content credits, Bill Riley, Karen Cook, and cast of tens of thousands of field test subjects. I'm running very early because this actually were not my right set of slides. So let me get one second here. I want to just catch up in one area. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Now we're going to do some really quick jumping ahead here. Da, 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 da. Okay, that wasn't too painful. When talking to clinicians and researchers, and now we're switching more to the clinician side for the audience here. One of the first requests were instruments, again, psychometrically sound. I mentioned this at the beginning of my talk. Um, go back and look at the instruments you've used, you're taught, and see can you find evidence of reliability or validity on a lot of instruments we use every day, and I'm not going to sit here and badmouth, but almost a guarantee you're using an instrument that has very questionable reliability. I mean, the big one that everyone's used in every emergency room in the world is a 0 to 10 point pain scale. It's highly, highly unreliable. It was never, ever, 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 ever designed for individual clinical use. It is always, 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 always used for clinical use. Um, it, uh, the accuracy of any score between three and seven isn't there. And guess what? We change people's treatment based on that score. We change the drug regimen they're on. We change what they do at home. We say, oh, you've moved on to the next level. There is no reliability for scores in the middle of that range. Um, and yet it's used all the time. So Promise said, look, if we're going to develop an instrument, we're going to give it a very high level. It's going to have to pass not just a smell test. It's going to have to prove that it can do its job. Brief and easy to use. Intellectual property free. I'm going to emphasize this again, 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 because I was just so, Bill Riley and I were so shocked a couple of weeks ago to hear that the predominant feeling on campus was or through HHS was, these instruments have high costs associated with them. They don't. They are free. Variety of settings, subgroups, multiple languages. So cover the full range of trait, no floor, no ceiling. We talked about the problem with no ceiling. If you have a ceiling, I'm going to show you a slide in a minute here. And again, no floor. Now, obviously physical functioning, if a person's bed bound, we're about as low as we can go. At the high end of physical functioning, we can go incredibly high. All these NIH systems using a common metric. Problem with a lot of instruments out there, unless you know the metric, and a lot of people do, you know the instruments in your area, I know that if this score goes from here to here, I know what it means. But the scores are different, right? The score here is 1 to 10. The score here is 180 to 120. The score here is 70 to 95. You don't know what it means. Trying to put these on the same uh, scales. Same instruments, same diseases. Same scale regardless of instrument format. So for these instruments, and it is the case with Promise, uh, NeuroQual, and Toolbox, many of these instruments are available in various lengths if it's on paper or computer format. No matter if you use single items, short form, long form, or CAT, the score is on the same metric. Okay. Obviously, the reliability of a one or two item instrument is going to be less than an eight item instrument. But the score is comparable, which is incredibly helpful. But most legacy measures fail to make this grade. Okay, psychometrically sound, not always. Brief, easy to use, rarely. You get in the trap, you give two or three instruments, we're done. Patients don't, don't do them. Intellectual property free, not always. We have a changing marketplace in there, but there's a lot of uh, market conditions that say, hey, we want to charge for these things. Applicable in a variety of settings sometimes. Again, go back to an instrument that you're using in your disease group, you're probably going to find the validity information is based on a different disease in a particular setting. And I'm going to say 100% of the time, I'm sure there's an exception, so I'll protect myself. 95% of the time, only for patients in a narrow age band that only had this disease, had no other symptoms, had nothing else, that didn't have emotional side effects, and that didn't have anything else going on. And for those of you, if I cleared the room of everybody who had patients that met that criteria, the room would be empty right now. That is just not real patients. OK. And with different subgroups, rarely. Available in multiple languages sometimes. 
and, and if so, rarely with the same meaning. That's a really good point. A lot of translations were somebody's research assistant, somebody down the hall translated the instrument. That's nice. It looks good. Hopefully it doesn't look like a bunch of instructions that came from an Asian manufacturing company that somebody didn't know what to do. But when we're done, the instrument doesn't have the same meaning. Okay. The goal of promise, the goal of the toolbox measures in Spanish was that a score means the same thing if you're given an English or Spanish or another language. So the score is directly comparable. That works for we removed items that had differences in language. We removed languages that had different, significant differences based on subgroups. Okay, now there are, there are a gazillion subgroups, so it's not in the whole world. Um, the only instruments out of everything I mentioned here that perform differently in different languages are two of the toolbox instruments. One is vocabulary, because vocabulary is different depending on language it is. In other words, oral reading, which is really the one where language makes a change, because any four or five-year-old can accurately read any word in Spanish. Okay, if it's got the correct accents on it. Most 50-year-olds cannot accurately read every word in the English language. I'm going to say all 50-year-olds can't read it because we have so many exceptions to rules and things like that. So, can most legacy instruments cover the full range of a train? Almost never. No floor effects sometimes. No ceiling effects never. Available for use across the age span rarely. Again, most instruments are created for narrow age ranges. Nor do legacy instruments have for many diseases, again, really rarely. There are very few instruments that weren't created for one place. Same scale applicable, again, never. And same instrument, different formats, really doesn't happen. So let's talk about the ceiling issue a little more, because this really bothers me. This is work that was done comparing the Promise Anger Cat and Aggression Questionnaire in a uh, longitudinal study. So at base, we're looking at effect size here. At baseline, okay, we've got both instruments are able to assess where a patient starts. At one month, we can see that both instruments have shown that there's an improvement. Something's happened. We can have a little party. Our intervention's working. It's great. We feel good about it. Legacy measure after three months demonstrates that there's no improvement. Effect hasn't changed. I'm the insurance company. I say, look, there's just no reason to give this treatment more than one month. That's the published research. Wait a minute. The promise instrument shows the effect is more than twice as much after three months that it came there. What's going on? Promise questionnaire does not have a ceiling. This questionnaire ceilinged out and was unable to show improvement because there weren't items that dealt with that improvement level. The treatment did indeed have an effect. The measure was not able to capture it. Of all the slides I show, this one bothers me the most. Successful study, real improvement after three months, traditional measure, wouldn't have captured it, we're done. The work you did for three months was shown to be not successful, no better than one month, cut off. That's not what's happening. There really was improvement there. It's the measure that was capped. Not the work you did, not the research, not the way the patients really feel. The measure simply was designed for fourth graders. And when a kid made it up to eighth grade, there were no eighth grade items. And therefore, there's nothing to show that they really improved. Ah, here's my CMS slide going out of here. Uh, this is a um, percentage of Medicare beneficiaries with multiple chronic conditions. 32% have two or three. Basically, 68% of Medicare beneficiaries have more than one condition. How in the world can we use instruments that have only been proven reliable and valid on a single, on a single disease at one time? And that's what we all do every single day. We need to move on to instruments and measures that can capture a trait across multiple conditions. Otherwise, because let's face it, all instruments that are disease-based were validated in this group right here. They were not validated relative to the 68% of real people that are out there. 
So often patients will want to settle for average function. I apologize for going a little bit back and forth, but again, physically active patients now recovering from an accident don't want to be considered cured because their instrument ceilings at the 50th percentile. Right? Basically, we tell people your treatment's over, you can walk around the block, you're done. I happen to have frozen shoulder, I've been alternating exercising every morning and evening, going to physical therapy, and I don't want to be considered cured when I'm at the 50th percentile. I'm, I'm hoping my whole life I'll never be cured at the 50th percentile. Athletes and other physically active people want to accurately differentiate between their levels of functioning. Okay. Again, even cancer patients, fatigue instruments show them to be above the clinically relevant range, may feel far away from their wanting to feel normal. Uh, we're playing musical slides. I may be done playing music. Oh, here we go. Let's do one more demonstration of CAT. If we haven't caught you with the two other ones, one more. This is not really applicable, but it's easier to show it. So most CAT testing until last couple of years was used for some kind of certification, um, um, medical board certification. If you're a surgeon, you're a nurse, we didn't really care about your level along the tray. We want to know, did you pass or fail the test? So how do we do that in a CAT? Well, typically, rather than worrying about the whole trait range, we give you your first question at the pass point of the test. If you get that question correct, we give you a harder question. If you get that one wrong, we give you an easier question. Get that one right, we give you a more difficult question. You pass it, we pass the test. Now, turns out that in almost any surgery board that I've helped deal with over time, we know 90% of the people whether they're going to pass or fail in about 10 or 12 items. Most tests go on for 60 or 90 items for two reasons. Um, one is people really hate having gone to college, graduate school, done their residency, and be told even that they passed in a dozen questions. It doesn't feel good. They really want a little bit more of an uh, experience. Um, people who fail cannot understand for the life of them how you could tell them they fail in a dozen questions. And we do have to give slightly longer tests for people in the middle. So let's talk about, this is, this is a much sadder experience. So the person fails at the center of the distribution. We give them an easier item. They fail that one at all. This is not going well. Give them a little bit easier item. Thank goodness they pass. And by the way, these are, tend to be multiple choice. So they should get some right. Get a little bit harder, they fail. They fail the test. Now, if this person is unable to answer questions at the pass point or a little bit below, there's just no reason in the world to give them questions that are much higher than their ability. We utilize this in high stakes testing to reduce exposure on the test. The reason we can give the nursing exam. Uh, every day of the year is. There are six, they release 6,000 items out at a time, and so no two people see the same items. They go so far as to say if you retake it, you don't even see items you took before. We only give them items related to their level. We don't give them items below it. We don't give them items above it. We give them enough items. It turns out there are some people who get the first couple wrong. They're nervous. It turns out people get them wrong that shouldn't are really high able people that think they're so smart they don't read the question carefully enough but we give them a break also. I do not want to face a judge in court with an attorney saying, they failed my client in 12 items. Judge, they're a successful surgeon, they've done this, they've done that. So fine, we do give them 60 questions, but if, the six, if they can't pass 60 questions in this range, we're done. We're not gonna give them two or 300, it's not gonna matter. And uh, one more here, and I think, Ah. 
want to reiterate one slide and then we will be a little early. Okay, we're just putting this up one more time. Psychometrically sound, brief, easy to use, intellectual property free, that's for you, it's for the for-profit company, it's for the drug company you're working with, it's for your collaborator in France. They can utilize these tools as well. If they need the technology basis, we've worked with groups at no charge to help them install algorithms within their own servers, and if they want to use a technology package that we're actively supporting, we're running that on a cost recovery basis. The more users we have, the cost of that will go down. Number of languages, subgroups, and multiple languages. Again, multiple languages just not for outside of the United States. Okay, you have plenty of patients here who should be taking an instrument in Spanish. Uh, National Children's Study is finding their groups that only speak uh, Thai, their groups that only speak uh, Vietnamese, particularly parents. Nice thing is that once a child's been about one year of schooling in the United States, they do just fine in English, but until that time, um, we need to uh, test them in their native language. I think we're going to run the risk of running early and have a little bit more time for questions. Um, Uh, thanks, Richard. That was terrific. Uh, I'm Rick Burzon. Uh We've met at one of these uh, ISACOL meetings. I was uh, one of the founders of that group, along with your colleague uh, Dave Sella, Donald Patrick, and a bunch of other people. Um, question I have is uh, um, when we used to present this stuff to the FDA uh, years ago, before they changed the name and it became patient reported outcomes. Uh, they were always very skeptical of accepting these kinds of um, outcomes uh, to um, evaluate uh, any kind of intervention, but medicines in particular. So I'm wondering uh, where that discussion is. Do, uh, does the FDA, I know that most, most of this is NIH work, and there was always a difference of opinion between the agencies, as there often is here in the government. Uh, so I'm curious to know, uh, where that discussion is, has the FDA sort of accepted these outcome results uh, uh, and will use them to in clinical trial work uh, uh, so that uh, uh, the pharmaceutical companies uh, with whom I worked a number of years ago can actually put that stuff in the label? I'm going to actually, not my normal style, but I'm going to hand that question off to uh, Dr. Jim Witter, who's uh, been much more involved in that on a day-to-day -day basis. You hear me? Okay. All right. Uh, the answer to your question is uh, that's a yes. Uh, we have been working with the FDA primarily through something called the Interagency Clinical Outcomes Assessment Working Group, uh, which is between a, a working group between FDA and NIH. And for the last number of years, we have been working with them about Promise as well as other um, instruments that are here at NIH. The current status is that uh, we have, with the fatigue bank, the adult fatigue bank, um, we are working with them in two diseases, rheumatoid arthritis and chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, to go through their qualification process through all that rigor. Um, they have recently very much embraced what we're doing. Um, they have finally sort of come around to understanding uh, what Promise has to offer in particular, and uh, it's moving forward um, at, a, at a good pace at this point in time. The industry also is picking up on this in the sense that we have an, an industry working group now with Promise, uh, and they are also sort of um, hoping and pushing the FDA to move this forward for exactly the reasons that you mentioned. And, and just as an aside, PCORI is also uh, in the same track. They understand the need for the FDA to uh, engage and accept these measures, and they're helping us with that effort. So the, the, the long answer is, uh, the short answer is yes, and the long answer is it's coming. Uh, we hope soon that this will be um, embraced in a wider variety of other, uh, some of the other instruments as well, but right now we're focusing on, on fatigue. Uh, 
Oh, yeah, okay. So, um, in the sense of... Right, okay. So, the, the, the uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, initiative that we have is actually working through uh, a couple of things. It's working through the OMRECT, uh, which is an, um, a, a think tank that's in rheumatology uh, to uh, come together in this effort to really qualify those things. So there's, this is an international effort as well now through uh, uh, that organization as well as through the uh, Critical Path Initiative. There is something there called the, the, the uh, PRO, the consortium, uh, and that also is an, another um, corollary effort that we've actually been engaged with and we're working with them, uh, in this case, in rheumatoid arthritis. So is this happening uh, disease by disease? Or? Well, th that's a good question, and we've been on that for a while. Um, the way that we're doing this is to address that sort of uh, piecemeal and to demonstrate to the FDA that uh, these instruments do what we say they do in diseases. Um, so as I mentioned, rheumatoid arthritis, in this case, chronic fatigue syndrome. And the idea then is that once we have established that, the, we will then be very uh, able to rapidly expand uh, this into other diseases and to look for um, then use across diseases, as Richard has been saying. So the first steps first, uh, we're trying to convince them that this works in the diseases of interest to, to them, and then it'll expand from that point out. No, that's good, and I appreciate that. I, I just want to say that we've been having these discussions with the FDA since I was in industry, which was 25 years ago or something or longer. And uh, the population is aging, and we really need this stuff now. Right. Because there are lots of, uh, I mean, uh, neurology is an obvious example where we, you know, people are aging, they're developing lots of conditions for which there aren't any laboratory or even surrogate measures. These kinds of tools are really essential uh, to, I don't have to tell you this, so. Yeah, and, and just the, the first, and I'm really pleased that the, the first effort is actually going to be um, also looking at CAT. Uh, we were concerned that they wouldn't really be interested in that because that is um, uh, very problematic for them from a variety of reasons because of their regulatory stance and the issues that they have to deal with. But the, the, these first efforts are going to be with CAT too, which is, uh, again, very highly encouraging. Do they now have psychometricians at the FDA? <laughs> they do, uh, and uh, they're looking for a new director of SEALD, uh, so we're all sort of uh, wondering who that's going to be, but yes, uh, they have now some great psychometricians on board, and like I say, we've been working with them for quite a while, so uh, we're, we're getting there. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have another question? Yeah, so in a related vein, uh, I think from the industry perspective, it makes sense to go disease by disease because they go to the FDA for very, sp very specific indications. But as you pointed out, two-thirds of Medicare patients, for example, have more than one condition. So my question is, in the institutions like the Cleveland Clinic, where you said it has been adopted for routine clinical practice, are they also looking at this you know, department by department, or is, this, is there a more holistic approach to it, and, and how is that working out? Okay. Um, for what I know of the Cleveland Clinic effort, uh, they originally started in their neuro clinics, and I believe it's being spread out to all their clinics. I'm, I don't want to be positive, but I know it first started out in one clinic, and then they put it in all their neuro clinics. So if you're seeing anybody in any neuro clinic, uh, while you're sitting in the waiting room, you take one of these. I'm not sure if they've implemented it or not. The other thing is you get an email the day before um, asking you to do it at home. I cannot tell you what the spread is of multi-disease there. It's Deb Miller oversees that effort uh, there. So I guess the real test will be adoption by the primary care providers. And do you have any sense of if that's happening? I, I think the way, given the overload on primary care providers today to do this, that, and the other thing, um, that it, it's going to take uh, the, a combination of the PCORI effort combined with uh, integration of these tools really in the EMR that each primary care provider is using. Now, so in orthopedics, for instance, uh, uh, field testing actually started last week, a couple weeks ago, and there's a clamoring for people that are hearing this is in field testing, please let me use this in my clinical practice. But I think we're, we're just at the dawn of people really using this in clinical work. I mean, there are dozens of exemplars. University of Washington has it. Many of their cancer clinics in, in, for primary providers, well, not prim well, in the, what's going on there. But we're at the dawn. This is it. I mean, these, these tools were created, you know, a, a decade ago. 
uh, and the research is never going to be finished, but is there to prove that it works, and it's just now uh, primary care providers are picking it up. The, the unfortunate finding of you know, my looking at history of uh, assessment adoption is people use assessments that they learn in school or they learn in their residency. And we are just getting to the point today where these instruments are there. DSM-5 includes mention of promise instruments. I mean, that's the beginning. People don't say, oh, look, a new thing out there. Because let's face it, nobody has time clinically to see what's the greatest and the best. Is this a fad, et cetera? So I think it's going to be, I think it's gonna be uh, escalated by meaningful use by PCORI and by it being readily available inside of uh, EMRs, but I, I think the, I, I don't want to fully predict in the future how long that's going to be. Other questions? Yes. Please identify yourself. Thank you. My name is Marnie Silverman. I work um, over at USIS for uh, CHAMP. Consortium for Health and Military Performance. And I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about Pasture and how the Promise tools are being altered for use by the military, or if someone's gonna address that later? later? Okay. Stay tuned till after the break. We won't, we won't hold you too long. Great, thank you. And on that note, maybe we I, should. Gonna, uh, well, uh, um, I gave a presentation at a National Children's Study last week and I was preempted by somebody who showed dancing three-year-olds. So, I thought we can end. We have, we have two and a half minutes. I, I'm just going to show uh, uh, two quick examples of these happen to be toolbox tools, but we're also bringing the promise tools for use in the National Children's Study. And let's see if volume works here. I'll cut this off by 1030. We're going to play together, and you're going to be touching pictures on the screen. Now let's practice. Touch the flower on the screen. Good job. Now we're going to learn about home base. This is your home base. Can you put your finger on home base and wait for the next picture? All right. If it's a rabbit, we choose that picture. Now you try. Keep your eye on the star in the middle of the screen and remember to put your finger back on home base after you answer. Ready? Here we go. Shape. This one. Is it the same or is it this one? This one. Okay. Max. Touch it. Touch the one you think is the same. This is the same shape, so you should choose this box. They're both boats. Put your finger back. Shape. Which one's the same? Touch the button that shows the same picture as that. This same one. Shape. That's right. Good job. Shape. Which one do you put? That's right. Great. Shape. So the entire cognition battery is being converted for use in the iPad, the Promise uh, self-report batteries for older children, the parent proxy measure is all being converted for use in the iPad. I should point out that using Assessment Center on our online service, I'm not sure it's available to Clinical Center, you can hand a patient an iPad and take a Promise Cat. The instrument fully formats for use in the iPad, making it look native. Um, this is a future in the waiting room to me, or this is a future of clinical use of these tools. These are three-year-olds taking a test that would otherwise require a PhD with a lot of experience, getting a score, and this, the pediatric battery is about 12 minutes long total in cognition. Uh, we can go here at the, at the toolbox rollout uh, last year, the head of uh, special ed for um, ah, Chevy Chase schools over here said, you know, we now get funding for two children to be tested a year. Tools like this that can be short, promise instruments, toolbox instruments, neural call instruments, are complete game changers in the assessment of kids, uh, kids and certainly of adults. And I think we have a break. Right. We'll reconvene. Thank you, Richard. We'll reconvene at 1040 uh, and uh, with a presentation for, from Dr. Kip. I have the great privilege of introducing Dr. Karen Cook. Um, she's a research associate professor uh, also at Northwestern, and she's going to be giving us an overview of the tools to assess adult and pediatric pain. Uh, this is going to be, uh, I think, quite entertaining. Thank you. Thanks very much to Jim and to all of you. I'm really happy to be here. I was thinking about this um, on the way here on the plane and realizing how how much it was by accident that I came into being associated with pain assessment and 
Um, at first I began to take it personally that people thought of me when they thought of pain, but really when I think about it, actually I can't think of any symptom that more drives healthcare utilization and also quality of life. So if you're going to be associated with a symptom, I think it's not a bad one to be associated with. So when I got the uh, email from uh, Priya and from Jim Witter about talking about uh, pain and promise, they kept talking about the promise pain six pack. This is a terminology that I had not heard. So I didn't really know where the metaphor was coming from. So I did a little bit of Googling and, and I finally found out why that uh, term had been used. Uh, apparently uh, Jim's been working out. Um, <laughs> He's begun to think in terms of such bodily metaphors. Um, and so let's take another closer look at those abs. Um, as it turns out, what they were talking about, despite the metaphor, was the fact that there are both adult and child measures for pain. And within those, there are three different kinds of measures for pain. Pain behavior, pain interference, and pain quality. Um, those are really great shorts, Jim, so I just want to compliment you on those. And as much as it's a shame to move from this slide, we'll go ahead and do that. So let's start by talking about pain measures in pediatric populations. Um, the PROMISE methods have been published, and I won't give you a full rundown of them now, but I do want to mention one, one portion of the methods that are associated with uh, with developing promise items, and that's what's called cognitive interviews. And I know many of you are familiar with what those are like, but basically it's getting respondents, asking them the questions, finding out from their perspective what they think the question is asking them, and how they came up with a particular response to make sure that the psychometrician and the clinician who sat in an office and came up with that item are communicating the same thing, or that the respondent is hearing the same question. So these interviews were done with children and adolescents, and the good news is that we found that as uh, kids as young as eight could comprehend most items. And so the decision was made to develop the uh, measures for ages uh, eight to 17 for self-report measures, and then also proxy measures for younger children. So let's start with the pain interference for pediatrics. Pediatrics pain interference comes in an eight item self-report and a proxy report short forms. And it, more than any of the other pain measures, has been tried out in many different clinical populations. And so there's this really a very large growing body of evidence about how successful the pediatric pain interference measure is. Um, this actually doesn't even include all of them. Uh, some of the other work that's not yet published also includes sickle cell anemia and uh, sickle cell disease and also um, uh, palliative care. So. Pain behavior is also going to be one of the areas that there's a pediatric measure for. And in fact, there are newly developed self-report and proxy report short forms for pain behaviors. They haven't been published yet. They've just now been developed. Um, they have I eight items each. They, like all the other promise items, are calibrated to an IRT calibration. I've seen the preliminary work on this. They fit well. They are functioning extremely well. They were calibrated with a group of 450 pediatric sample, age 8 to 17. So those will be coming on board. Pain quality, I'm going to tell you more about this later, but right now this is a stay tuned for pediatric pain quality. I can tell you that when we first in PROMISE did pain measures, both adult and pediatric, um, in adult we administered a number of pain quality items in wave one, this is very early on. And unlike pain interference or pain behavior where you have this uh, single unidimensional kind of idea that's driving how people answer the items. This was not really the case, did not prove to be the case in pain quality. And this, for those of you who are pain clinicians or clinicians who deal with uh, patients' pain, this probably won't surprise you because there, in fact, are many different qualities of pain. And so NIH sponsored a Promise Pain Quality sub Supplement Project. And like I say, I'm going to tell you more about that when I get to talking about adult pain. But I'll just mention that as part of that, in a sample of 309 
uh, uh, children, these pain quality items were administered. I also think it's interesting to note, and um, uh, Dr. Essie Morgan DeWitt is one of the ones who's highly responsible for it, and she wanted it noted that, in fact, when we decided to do the items for pain quality in this pain quality supplement, we chose as a basis the pediatric wording because it was clear and it communicated well. Um, and I think generally that's what you find is, is that for both pe for pediatric measures and for adult measures, the more clear you can be, the more simple the language, the better. So now we have these adult pain measures and we have pediatric measures. And what's going on now is an attempt to do something that hasn't been done before, and that's link the scores from the pediatric to the adult pain measures. And this is called vertical linking. So the idea here, and this, this work is actually going on right now, uh, Darren DeWalt, David Thyssen, David Tolsky are working on this and, and completing preliminary work right now. When this is completed, this will be a very exciting thing to have because you will now have a measure that goes across the entire lifetime. And in the same way that if you have hemoglobin, it means the same thing in pediatric as it does in adult. Now you may have different normative values for different age groups, but the metric will be the same across the entire lifespan. And by the way, this is not just happening in pain, but in many of the other promise uh, domains as well. So when Promise began, if you look at the original statement of purpose, it talked about the use of measures in research, in clinical research, but not, uh, there was not a lot in there about the use of them in clinical settings for just patients. Um, and one of the things that I was able to be in Promise after the first year, so the, the last uh, after starting in 2005, so one year into the development. So I've been able to kind of watch the field as it's progressed. And as promise has gone from a glimmer in someone's eye to what it is now with this whole set of validated measures, one of the things that's happening outside is more and more emphasis of the idea of using patient-reported outcome measures in clinical settings. And so as that happened, the people, the scientists, and um, the leaders in Promise were aware of this move and really began to push on enabling these measures to be used in clinical settings. So let me give you a couple of examples for the clinical. Uh, at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, when a patient arrives, uh, he or she is given the t a tablet. And then based on that patient's information, this is, this is a child who comes into the clinic, Based on that child's information, a computer algorithm selects which domains to give this patient in their own tablet. The patient starts in the waiting room filling this out, but they might get called into the physician's office later, so then they can just take that tablet with them on into the exam room and finish it there. And then those pros, those patient reported outcomes and reports of those are available to the provider to inform the visit. Uh, one of the things that Dr. DeWitt is doing at Cincinnati Children's Hospital is they are experimenting with using a pain interference threshold to key to interventions. So if a child reaches, based on their report, self-report of pain interference, reaches a particular threshold, it will trigger at the next at the next appointment, a nursing intervention for that person, for that child, and experiencing his or her pain. Now, currently, the way that the system's set up, it's triggered for the next visit, but in the future, it will actually be triggered in real time. So this person expresses this level of pain interference, and right then, it triggers a nursing intervention, and so you can see how this kind of triggered threshold uh, approach can really inform, not only inform, but actually initiate um, patient-centered interventions. And I like to think about the fact that used to when we thought about patient-reported outcomes, um, we thought very rightly, of course, about how important it is to get the patient's voice in research, right? It seems like now, finally, with these clinical applications, we're using patient-reported outcomes in patient-relevant ways, not just to research them, but actually to inform how we can help them in medical interventions. 
So let's move on and look at the adult measures for a second. So starting with the left side of Jim's six pack right here, we'll start with pain interference. In pain interference, there's a four item, a six item, and an eight item short form. And there's also a cat item bank. So because the promise measures are calibrated using an item response theory approach, short form scores, cat item bank scores, those are all in the same metric, so they're directly comparable. Uh, pain interference has been used a great deal in the literature, and I'm not even going to try to list all of the populations. Uh, the second measure within the uh, adult pain bank is the pain banks are is the pain behavior measure, which is a seven item short form and also has a cat item bank. And then there's pain quality, and here's where I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the supplement. I mentioned before that the pediatric group had 309 um, individuals, and for this supplement, we intentionally selected disease, disease populations or diagnostic categories, rather, that either typically were associated with neuropathic pain or were not associated with neuropathic pain. For pediatric, the samples included uh, uh, JIA, uh, junior, uh, I mean, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, uh, juvenile onset fibromyalgia, and, uh, and um, I think sickle cell anemia, I can't remember exactly. For adult, there were adults, we collected 963 responses. The neuropathic diagnoses associated were diabetic neuropathy, um, chemotherapy induced neuropathy, and then the non-neuropathic was rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. This gave us a nice ability to do something that you would want to, a pain quality measure to do to see if responses and, and scores and thresholds or in particular items could help you distinguish between people who had non-neuropathic pain and those who had neuropathic pain. So the findings are, are pretty new off the press. Uh, what we found is that five items, numbness, stinging, tingly, pins and needles, and electrical, did the best job of efficient, efficiently and economically distinguishing among these different disease conditions. And a cut point was identified, which with a, has a sensitivity of 0.76, a specificity of 0.73, and a percent, quote, correct classification of 74%. So, you know, pretty good job with a five item scale. We're also experimenting uh, in an exploratory way of looking at a nociceptic scale with items that would include things like achiness, tenderness, soreness, and um, a, there's one left off here, deep, deep pain and also uh, steady pain. So this is the PROMISE six pack, um, adult and child behavior quality and interference. And so you may be sitting there and you're thinking, well, that's great. I use adult pain interference measures, but I have my own scale. You know, maybe you use the brief pain inventory seven item pain interference subscale. And uh, Richard's already stole my thunder on this, but I want to say that if you already use something like the BPI or the SF36 bodily pain, and you'd like to change, but you don't want to lose all those data that you collected, the connection with all those data that you've collected in the past, then we have an app for that. And as Richard said, it's uh, Prosetta Stone. And this project was used to link many different uh, common measures that are used, we call them legacy measures, to promise equivalents of the same domain. And so if you go to the Prosetta website, you'll see there um, a tab for linking tables. And if you go to the linking tables and you scroll down, you'll see a, a place for promise pain. And you'll see, I uh, should back up there. Oh, well, you saw it, promise pain. And there you will see crosswalks available, linking tables that associate a BPI pain interference scale with a promise metric and the short form uh, bodily pain scale to the promise metric. So let's take a look. This is very similar to what Richard showed you for depression. Here you had the BPI pain interference score. Let's just kind of scroll down and look a little bit. And you can see right there at a score of 31, on the BPI, 
that's roughly equivalent to a 59.9 on the promise metric, so a 60, a standard deviation above the mean. Now, notice what you get out of this. You not only get this link to the BPI, but with the BPI itself and just that score, you really don't know how it associates with the general population, right? But through the promise link, now you actually do. So you get that added advantage of having an interpretive context for understanding a particular score. The other thing you get is this other column here, which is a standard error. And as Richard showed you on those slides, and in fact, um, when we think about classical approaches, we measure reliability, which would be like the inverse of standard error, right? When we do that, we assume that the measure is reliable at the same level across the entire continuum. And yet, in fact, as Richard's slides show, that is not the case. So you get um, several things out of this crosswalk. So I want to give you a couple of examples. We've already talked about many of the ways that promise measures have been incorporated into EPIC and REDCap and all of these other kinds of things. I want to talk about one particular kind of use that's, being, that's happening that I'm particularly excited about. And that's the use of adult pain measures for registries and clinical use, both at the same time. So I'm going to talk about two different instances of this. One is happening at Stanford University, and it's called HERO. The other is happening with the Department of Defense, and that's PASTOR, which um, very nicely was asked about prior to, to my coming up here. Um, so let's look at HERO. HERO at Stanford is the Health Electronic Registry of Outcomes, uh, a very convenient acronym. And it is both a research tool and a clinical tool. And uh, the way they have it set up is at the Stanford Pain Clinic, when a new patient comes in, any new patient, they take a collection of measures. And they are not just the promised pain measures, but also promised measures of physical function and fatigue and social function and all of these other types of correlates of pain. And then this slide is borrowed from one of my colleagues at Stanford who was showing an example of their report mechanism. So here's a particular individual who's come in at a first time at baseline. And you can see, remember that the 50 is the, um, th this is done in percentile scores, so 50 is the 50th percentile. And you see how this, this person is above average in depression and anxiety, um, and the physical function is reversed, so I won't won't go into that, but the pain interference is very high, pain behavior is very high. So medication intervention happened at the first time point. And then let's look down at the third time point, and you can see that at that time point, a health education was, uh, was, um, was used as an intervention, and you see this additional, additional reduction of poor outcomes. Um, what's nice about this is here's you've got a report on an individual person, and it's, co it's, it's linked, it's laid over actual interventions, and at the same time, you've got several things happening at one time. So in one very informative visual, you get a snapshot of what, ha what is happening in this person's life over time and how it's associated with different interventions. And now I'll talk about Pastor. Um, Pastor is part of, came out of the Army Management Task Force. And this initiative was uh, initiated by General Schumacher. And the charge to Pastor was that they develop standards and approaches and recommendations that would optimize care for warriors and their families and that would standardize the Department of Defense and the VA's approach to pain management. Um, pain management is a huge issue in the Department of Defense and of great concern to them. And um, so the Army Ma Management Task Force developed a report. And one of the things that they said is that we need a screening tool and we need a registry because we need to know where patients are when they come in and we need to also be able to collect a lot of data so we can ask important research questions that will have an impact on how we treat patients in the future. So that's what PASTOR is, the Pain Assessment Screening Tool and Outcomes Registry. So January of this year, this is Walter Reed Hospital, January 1 of this year, 
started um, Pastor's beginning pilot. And so now when a new patient comes into the warrior transition unit, he or she, before coming into their clinic visit, receives an email that asks them to go online and to complete a series of assessments. And those assessments include pain. Again, it's very similar to the ones that are being used at Stanford, not accidentally, by the way. They were aligned that way on purpose. And pain correlates such as social function, fatigue, sleep, um, mental health issues, uh, things like substance abuse, alcohol use, um, traumatic stress syndrome, um, other, other issues like that. So right now, we have now got it in place. It's actually working in a real live clinic at Walter Reed. The exciting thing about this is now when our partners in the military uh, who are part of the Army Pain Management Task Force go to their leaders, they can say, look, this is something that's actually operating. We are using this to help manage our patient's pain in the clinic setting. Uh, exciting thing about it is I think starting next month, this very similar kind of thing, the same measures, will be rolled out at Balboa uh, Navy Medical Center. It also will be rolled out at the uh, Madigan Army Medical Center Pain Clinic. And then in a very exciting um, development at Army Medical, uh, Madigan Army Medical Center, they have the center for their IT solutions and software development. And so with a contract from the US Department of Defense, Madigan with help from Northwestern University is integrating using an API the promised measures into their Army medical record system that already exists. So it will flawlessly integrate with what, what you see here, which is what their patient dashboard looks like. With plans later on to use it, again, to use thresholds that trigger particular specific uh, clinical, um, clinical potential inf interventions, and also to use it for big data collection. So very important to the Army task force at the beginning was that this be a clinical tool, that this not just be something for researchers. And very early they identified that in order for that to happen and be of use in the clinical setting, then you needed to not just collect data, you needed to have information. And the step between a lot of data and real usable, actionable information is reporting. And so we spent a lot of time developing a graphical pain report that clinicians will receive. And we have it now down to two, two and a third pages. And I'll show you most of the parts of it. In, um, very strategically, the front page of it, in, which is I'm gonna show you first, are the things that should be most in, in the clinician's face at the beginning of the clinic visit. So we have a pain map, and you can see that not only does a patient report his or her pain locations, where all do I hurt, but also where do I hurt the most today. Um, in addition, there's a table down below that shows number of pain locations over time. The reason we added this is because of research that says that number of pain locations is a very important predictor of how patients do. Also, morphine equivalent dose over time. All of this tied together nicely. We also created a, um, a warning screen so that if this patient had emergent issues that should be dealt with, those things would be very visible to the clinician. So we have a PTSD screen, alcohol misuse, abuse, depression, and anxiety screen. So notice that for this particular mock-up pretend person, that they've got a negative screen for depression, anxiety, and PTSD, but their alcohol misuse abuse score is up. And so you get a nice little um, exclamation point there, which warns the clinician, hey, this might be an area that you should address with the patient. So then we also have, again, using a percentile score, the promised outcomes shown over time with, because they requested it, better health being up. And so you get so much out of this one little picture. I mean, it looks like, you know, it's just a graph. But you see, like, physical function, show, social function, and pain interference, and how they're tracking together over time. You see also where this patient is relative to the U.S. general population. 
And one of our goals in the future is to not just have norms for general population, but within the DOD to have DOD specific norms, which would be another interpretive context to help understand the scores. And then this also is part of it. When the patient sits down to fill out the pastor report, one of the things that he or she is invited to do is to list three activities that are important to them and are currently limited by pain. And then they're asked to say, at what level are they able to perform them currently? So what's nice about this is on that very front page, the clinician knows three most important things to this patient that are affected by pain, and how that patient is doing on them today, and how that tracks over time. So the idea of this is it really centers the clinician's attention on what the patient has said is important to them, um, and, and really promotes the kind of conversation that you would want to be happening within the clinical encounter. encounter. So the idea then is we have a screening tool for with Pastor, and then also because, imagine this, we've started at the Army, Red, Army uh, Walter Reed Army Medical Center, uh, moving on to Madigan, to Balboa, and many, many other medical centers within the military health system that want to come on board. When you start talking about the size of military health system, very quickly you have a big, big registry of data to use to ask the kinds of questions that you can only ask with larger data sets because you need to ask things at a subgroup level. And what's also nice about this is these items that are being collected as part of PASTOR are being collected at Stanford as part of their pain registry. They're very similar to the ones that Epic has been using. They're very similar to the ones that many of the other things that Richard showed you are using. So you can imagine now this ability, we don't have 40 different measures for fatigue, for fatigue, but we have similar data collected across many populations, across many clinical settings, and these can be combined for the kind of large-scale studies that we really need to, to use to know things, not just how does this mean compared to that mean, but which kind of patient gets better with which kind of intervention. So this is the future then. Big data will allow us to ask really big questions about pain and pain management and other how outcomes, like who gets better, specifically who gets better with what kind of treatment. Um, this will help us answer how to best manage pain, something that we can only do with big data. All right, we have to end with this slide, of course. Um, do you have any, I, oh, I can't ask you if you have any questions, I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to ask you at a later time if you have questions, because I only have a minute left, so. I gotta stop, stop send, sending Karen selfies. Um, <laughs> I said it was gonna be entertaining, but I had no idea. Anyway, uh, the, the, uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was, I had the privilege of giving a presentation on Promise and uh, Toolbox. And folks in the audience came up to me and they said, why do you tell us about all these great tools if we don't have access to them here uh, at NIH? And that really was the, uh, the impetus for what we have here today. And one of those people, was Margaret Bevins, who unfortunately, she's a, she's a nurse in the clinical center, uh, who unfortunately developed the flu yesterday, we found out, so she uh, is not able to be here. Um, but we do have Leslie uh, Whirlin here, uh, who will tell us uh, what has been going on in terms of early adoption of these patient center tools and technology here on campus. So uh, thank you, Leslie, for substituting, and we'll look forward to this. Hey, so good morning everyone. Um, thank you all for being here today and allowing me to share our experience with using the management information system and collecting patient-centered outcomes here at the NIH Clinical Center. Um, so as uh, Dr. Uh, Jim just said, uh, Margaret is out with the flu and um, I uh, very unfortunately um, is not able to deliver this presentation to you all today. Um, 
to say that she's devastated is quite an understatement. Um, she's really been driving this project for several years to bring it here to this program um, intramurally for us. Um, so she's very passionate about this work that we do, and um, she's uh, really worked very hard with our team to bring it here. So with your patience and understanding, I will do my best to serve as her substitute, and, um, and no one is more sorry than I am that she's not here this morning. <laughs> Okay, so here we go. Let's see. Just click in here. Oops, okay. Um, so early this morning, you've heard from previous speakers that uh, Promise, the NIH toolbox, and the NeuroQual measures offer valid assessments for critical concepts for patients that we see here at the NIH Intramural Research Program. And now they're also available to us via an electronic data collection system here at the clinical center. So the objective of this presentation is really for me to outline the process um, that as you contemplate incorporating this new system into your research programs from our lived experience of using this new resource at the clinical center. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Okay. So assuming that we all agree from the start that these concepts are enhance our overall understanding of the impact of our research on our subjects, um, I'm going to show you how we can move forward with this new resource. And as you see on the side, this, um, this may differ based on uh, what your previous experience with PROs are in your studies. So there are kind of two camps of people that we believe are in the audience. And camp one are those people with PROs experience. Um, and today you're going to learn how to implement this into your research programs. Then there are folks in um, Camp 2, and those, that don't, those are people that don't necessarily have the experience with collecting PROs, and, he, and hopefully you're here today to learn how you can begin to start that process. Okay. So when considering the traditional process with legacy measures, um, and before we had this option to use the me measurement information system, collecting PROs included many steps for you and your research teams to follow. For example, finding the best assessment tools that measure the concept you want in your population was quite a challenge. And then sometimes there are the fees and permissions that we learned about with some measures. There are also challenges with managing the data once you have it, scoring it, maintaining those files, and then understanding what that data is really telling you once you actually have it. So these can be significant issues, especially when you consider those people that are in camp two, those people without that PRO experience, like where would you even begin? So with this system, it's less complex for us. It offers many advantages to intramural researchers that were not previously available. This new measurement information system will address many of the traditional barriers noted on the previous slide, like there are no fees with its use. It's web-based, so it offers a, a, um, a, the ability to collect and store the data. It offers options for specific assessment tools, and you can choose either the web-based option or a paper-flexible option if you so choose. There's assistance for scoring, or it's, the scoring is done with some, and I'll explain that in just a minute. And then there's also guided inter interpretation of what those scores mean. And additionally, there are tools in various languages as available. Okay. So to understand the impact on research, um, we're going to start by developing partnerships that ensure our success with the system. And that will vary based upon what camp you're in. So for those of you in Camp 1, those with the PRO experience, you could start by partnering with staff at, here at the Assessment Center at the NIH. And those are the people from the AC Light team. This process could begin with you reviewing the measures that are available and you learning about the AC Light system and developing your survey. And um, you'll get more information about developing a survey with AC Light after this presentation. For those of you that don't have prior experience with PROs in your research, you might consider starting off by partnering with somebody here in the clinical center or in the um, extramural program that has experience with PROs to help guide you. Um, they could help you select the most appropriate measures for your population before moving on to begin building that survey in the AC light system. So to illustrate the options, consider the following example. Um, this is based on one of our previous research studies and from the perspective of a, a researcher with camp, in Camp 1, so with PRO experience. 
Um, this is actually based on our study. So um, we examine, um, issue, uh, examine health-related quality of life, symptoms, and caregiver burden. And this new measurement information system offers comparable measures with the concepts that we um, explore for some of the concepts, but not all. So for health-related quality of life, there's the Promise Global Health. And an important feature, um, as mentioned by Dr. Gershon, was that the Promise Global Health measure permits you to compare um, data that you've collected previously with the MOS SF36 or offers um, standardized comparison tables for some of the other um, commonly used measures. Um, there are also promise measures for the common symptoms that we measure in our study, such as pain, fatigue, or sleep disturbance. But what there wasn't one for, for our particular study, was one for caregiver burden. Um, so we were able to create a custom measure and incorporate that into our survey. So if, if, you're, um, if you're in Camp 2, without prior PRO experience, you could start by reviewing the measures that um, taking a step back and reviewing the measures that are available in this system. So looking at what are the promised measures and the concepts, the NeuroQual and the NH toolbox to determine the relevance of those measures to your specific population before you begin building your survey. So this is just a screenshot um, and it's uh, a very brief listing of the promised measures available. Um, as you see at the bottom, there's a variety of different domains that are available and there are um, measures for adults, pediatric patients, and then also patient proxy. And you'll see that some are short forms where, and some are item banks, so those are your CAD forms. This are, these are um, a brief listing of the NeuroQual measures that are available, the domains, and again, you see that you have both adult and pediatric measures um, in a variety of formats, either in CAT form or in a short form bank. And finally, in the system, there, there's also the NIH toolbox. Um, and again, you have um, di many different concepts and um, different options for you to choose from. So the advantage of this system is really that regardless of what measure you choose, whether it's the NIH promise, uh, or the, the promise, the NeuroQual, or the NIH toolbox, or if you're adding custom measures, that you can really customize this approach to meet your needs of your population. So the, the next um, example I want to show to you um, is uh, an example of a study where um, of someone in Camp 2, so a researcher that has no PRO experience, and they actually partnered with Dr. Bevins um, to do PRO, uh, incorporate PRO into their clinical research study. So this is a real life example. Thir um, the protocol is um, Dr. Ronan Desmond's uh, protocol, and he was looking at the efficacy of this new agent in severe aplastic anemia patients as the primary outcome. But as you know, um, Dr. Desmond not only wanted, but he needed to incorporate PRO data into his biomedical um, into his research um, for this drug. So, and he added that, wanted to add that as a secondary outcome. And that was, um, he wanted to look at health-related quality of life, so he partnered with Dr. Bevins to examine health-related quality of life. They came up that that was an important feature and selected the Promise Global Health. They also realized that there's some, a measure that they probably should include given this population and the FACET measures were selected for this population but were not included in the, um, the measurement information system. And then there were specific symptoms that they wanted to look at and there were promised measures available. So um, in this situation, the, this is completely customizable and um, could be developed in AC light using all of these measures. And this is a real life example of what Dr. Bevins does at this center. Okay, so now let's consider an example of um, of a research of when the researchers in Camp One. So this is a researcher that has experience with PROs and uses them as primary outcomes in their research studies. The one listed on the screen is our study, um, and it's the web-based patient-reported outcome measurement information system to explore burden and stress in cancer caregivers, and we refer to it as Promise to Explore Basic. Um, and this really is um, the 
testing the platform of AC light here at the NIH Clinical Center. So as previously mentioned, um, we, uh, there were a variety of measures available in the system to look at the concepts that were really important to us in this study. There was not um, one for the caregiver reaction, the caregiver burden, assessing caregiver burden, so that had to be created as a custom measure. But what's interesting is that um, the NIH, that we had previously used the UCLA perceived stress scale um, in some of our other work, and um, the NIH toolbox has incorporated the same scale into their, the measures that they offer. So the rest of the talk will really focus on the concrete examples of how we developed the study and how we're using it here in the clinical center now. So this is an example of um, a participant registration screen that we use in the PROMISE study. So this is what it would look like if you built your survey with the AC light system here at the NIH. And um, please note that patients can self-register or they can, um, or the team can select to pre-register their subjects. Um, and we've actually opted for the pre-registration option. So um, it doesn't take very much time or effort to do this. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but you just fill in the study arm, um, the site, and then um, you assign them a username, a password, and then you can identify if they were consented. So this um, can also be helpful for IRB tracking and reporting. Additionally, you would fill out the next tab here. So you would move over there. You fill out the age of your patient, um, their gender, race, and ethnicity, and this helps you with your enrollment inclusion reporting to the IRP. So once um, a subject has either registered themselves or you've registered them, um, this is the screen that they would come to to begin their survey, and you would, uh, they would log in with the assigned username and password to begin it. This is a screenshot um, and an example of what, a, um, of what the patient would see give, using a promise item. So you'll see that there's only one item per page and um, it, it avoids that confusion of having a survey with multiple items to answer on one page. This is an exa example of what an NIH toolbox item looks like. So you'll see that it looks a little bit different than um, the promise measure, but it is at the same, um, the same in that it's one question per page and that this automatically advances for the patient once they've answered. Now, I also wanted to show you um, an example of a custom item so that you'll see that it's really that they're not gonna get three different looking kinds of surveys if you're selecting different measures. So this is an example of a custom item and it's one of the items from our health promoting lifestyle, a measure that we use um, titled the health promoting lifestyle two. So also what's important to see is um, for you all as you begin to consider this option for your studies is um, what it looks like for the, your research teams and um, your administrators. So when you're creating new patients, um, you're going to this option. When you want to look at the data that you already have, you have a variety of options. So you can look at registration data, you can look at their assessment scores, you can look at the consent registration data, or you can even look at a pivot table. So this is all the data um, that's in, if you have custom measures and um, a variety of NIH toolbox or promise measures or neurofall. And then also here you can look at your participant list, and this is just a brief summary at the top of all those items. Oops. Okay, so we thought it would be helpful for you to, for you to see really what you're gonna be getting when you do have some data. So this is um, data from one of the subjects or some of the subjects we've collected on this study. And I'm just gonna highlight. So this is one case you'll see here. And these are the um, scored items from the NIH toolbox, the promise measures, and the neuroqual measures that we're using in our study. And then if I click again, where I'm just gonna highlight here is anxiety. So you can see that anxiety was a computer adaptive test. It's from the item bank. The raw score was eight for this subject. And their T-score, their final score was 56.49. And as you've heard this morning, everything is based on that standardized scale where 50 is where the general population sits. And in this case, we can see that the, the subject is maybe just a little bit more anxious than the general population. And this is the score that you would use in your analysis. 
So although there are many advantages um, to having this new information system, um, we wanted to share that it's not all roses and, and, and great. There are still some things we have to work on um, that need your consideration as you begin to use this incorporated in. Um, there are some issues that we've noticed with compatibility. So some browsers work better than others. Um, it's also not, it's not been functioning exactly perfectly, so we don't recommend it for use in a mobile media. So if a patient only has a smartphone to access this system, it's probably not the best option at this time, but hopefully we'll be addressing those in the future. There are um, some issues with creating manual um, tools or the custom tools. So you just have to develop those in advance. They have to be translated over into the AC light system. And then there's some testing that has to go to ensure that what you really are putting in is what you want the patients to see and, and what you're supposed to be doing. There is no automatic scoring of the custom instruments. So the, the nice feature is when you're using the NIH Promise, the toolbox, or the, I'm sorry, the, the Promise, the NIH toolbox, or the Norcal measures, they're automatically scored for you. That's not the case for your custom measures, and that has to be developed and takes some time and consideration in advance of developing your survey. And then also the response data. I had a patient um, that we enrolled tell me afterwards. She said, oh, you know, I think I might have answered one of those questions incorrectly. I meant to say this, but I, I really said this. So unfortunately, we can't really go back and edit that or isolate that um, other than making hand notations in our data. An, an additional thing that we notice is there's not a way to track when our subjects are completing the data um, or completing their survey. So we'll have to go in and export data to see if they've completed, but there's not that automatic notification that a subject has completed it. And right now, the use of this system is pretty much limited to clinical, I'm sorry, to research care. Um, because we don't have it connected to the, the patient's medical record, which limits our application to clinical care at this moment. So as some of you might be considering this measures or this system um, um, as a value to, um, that, to, to screening for clinical practice, this could be a feature in the future once the considerations are, are um, addressed for how we can incorporate that data into the electronic medical record. But I hope you all see that there is definitely a future potential for its um, use in clinical practice, but we're just not there yet. So this is obviously an option for you um, for your research studies, and we'll hopefully be working towards that and the, the other in the future. But I want to thank you all for your time and letting me share with you our team's experience with the research application of this new system. And I'll be glad to take any questions um, that you might have, and I'll do my best to answer on behalf of our team. Thank you. Okay. I understand we'll take questions at the end. Thank you. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Leslie. Um, for the rest of the morning, what we wanted to do was to give those of you that will not be in the training this afternoon a sense of what you've now heard as AC light. Um, and so we have the good fortune to have Nan Rathrock here. Uh, Nan is a research associate professor from the Medical Social Sciences at Northwestern uh, with Richard um, and Karen. And we also have uh, Yang Fan, uh, who is the director of the intramural IT and bioinformatics program here at NINS. So this will just be uh, an effort to sort of give you an overview of what this might look like. Uh, if you, I hope you have signed up for the um, in-depth training this afternoon, which is going to be in Building 12A in Room B51. So without any further delay, uh, Nan and Yan. Thanks, Jim. I'm happy to be here to represent the Assessment Center team. Um, I won the coin toss, so I'm going to be talking, and Yang will be available to answer all of your hard questions um, when we get to the end here. So that's our plan. Um, so I want to talk about Assessment Center. It's a clinical research data collection tool um, that was actually one of the aims in the Promise RFA. Um, there was this awareness that if we create all these great measures and don't actually create a way for people to administer those measures to patients or study participants, it's um, not going to be particularly effective. So we developed assessment center that has lots of bells and whistles that allows you to use these new tools. Um, it's, it functions by allowing you to create a study-specific URL that a participant can access. 
um, in a clinic or remotely. And the library, as you've seen, includes everything from Promise, NeuroCall, and the NIH toolbox. You can also have researcher completed instruments, um, and so that's helpful for some chart review data or other things like that. Um, as Leslie indicated, you can create custom short forms, so if you want to add an instrument that's not part of the library, you can do that. And you can have single time point or multiple time point studies. Other features were developed to really enhance the research applicability of this software. Uh, you can have multiple study arms, so if you have participants who should be receiving different instruments, you can set that up. You can also do a ridiculous amount of randomization. You can randomize items within an instrument. You can randomize instruments. You can randomize groups of instruments. So if you have any concerns about order effects, um, this is a good tool for you because you can randomize until, um, until the cats come home. Um, we also have some accrual tracking features. So you can monitor um, how you're doing towards reaching your accrual goal. Um, one thing that I think is extremely helpful is data is available at any time by somebody with permission to export data on your team. Um, and as you saw um, on a screenshot Leslie showed, and I'll show a little later, the data is separated into different files. So if you have contact information, you can keep that separate from your uh, patient-reported outcome data. So that's helpful in uh, easing the task of de-identifying data prior to analyses. There's also an automated data dictionary, which has um, made our team really popular with statisticians, um, because you can see exactly what the item ID was, exactly what the item was, and what every response was. Um, so that helps clarify when you're doing analyses years after study setup happened, uh, what was actually included. Um, as I said, the instrument library has everything that we've heard about today. NIH Toolbox, as you heard, is um, a little unique in that you do have to get permission to access it um, because of concerns about security. The other thing I want to highlight is if you have no interest in using Assessment Center as a data collection tool, it's worth exploring at least to pull down the PDFs for various instruments. So if you wanted to look at a Promise short form, you could go into Assessment Center and pull down a PDF. The funding for Assessment Center was provided by the NIH through grants, um, NeuroQual, Promise, and Toolbox. Um, that covers our hardware, software maintenance, and new feature development. We have a help desk um, that's available during business hours in Chicago. Um, but I do want to note that we are transitioning and that there are going to be support and hosting fees uh, for some users in some instances. I'm making this as vague as possible. Um, uh, as, we, as we shift away from NIH funding to a sustainability model. So, to access Assessment Center, um, it's a web-based tool. Um, you could right now go online and go to www.assessmentcenter.net. Anyone can register. Um, you can see in the upper right corner here is this register new user link. You can register today um, and poke around. The one thing about Assessment Center is that all of the data that you use, uh, that you collect within the application is stored on a server owned by Northwestern University in Chicago. So this presented a problem um, for the NIH Clinical Center because we learned that the Clinical Center is kind of like Vegas, that what happens here has to stay here. Um, they couldn't have data stored in Chicago. It needs to be here locally on an NIH server. And so this presented a challenge. Um, the solution that we came up with was what you've heard referred to as AC light. It sounds to me like a soft rock station, and that is not, that's not what it is. Um, so, so I'm going to try to explain the link between Assessment Center and AC Light using clip art. And I will say I'm trained as a health psychologist, not as anything related to informatics. So, um, so forgive me, Monica, my colleague, who is the Assessment Center project manager, um, for this attempt at explaining um, how this works. So we start with uh, an NIH person who is at their typical workstation. 
There exists a Sassman Center, as I said, housed on a server at Northwestern. And behind a deep, deep firewall on the NIH server is AC light. So what happens is an NIH staff person points their browser to Assessment Center. And they log in to Assessment Center. They, they do all of their study setup. So they pick which instruments they want to include. They decide how many time points. Um, they configure the study exactly as they want. And then they launch it for data collection so it's ready to go. They can't use Assessment Center as the data collection platform um, according to NIH policy. So what they then, this person then does is directs their browser to the AC light system. And the first thing they need to do is get through um, this firewall into the system. And so they have to log on using their NIH login. And once they do that, they can get to AC light. AC light then calls up assessment center and says, hey, there's this awesome study that this person just set up. I'd like to pull it in to AC light. Assessment center says, sure, pushes all of the instruments, time points, templates, templates, all of that over. And so now it's available on AC light. And then this investigator would use AC light as the data collection platform to collect data and then also where they extract data. Now the genius of, of this system, um, and I attribute this to Monica and her team, is that what this means is that as new instruments are developed, as, as we heard about adaptions and, and new short forms, new domains are developed and loaded into assessment center, they're automatically available here. We don't have to go through any additional process of pushing things over. They'll, they'll be part of the library and you can use them. So it's, it's good for sustainability that you'll always have access to, to the new instruments as they join the library. So you saw this um, in Leslie's slides. I'm going to just show you what a participant would see if they were c completing an assessment in AC Light. Um, there's a welcome page that's customizable. This is a super boring one that I made, um, assuming uh, this was an orthopedic outcome study. You have the ability to uh, log in if you already have a login, if you're pre-registered or you're returning to a second or third assessment, or you can start from scratch. Um, the interface, very simple. This is an example of a promise mobility item. This is another promise mobility item. This is a promise upper extremity item, as is this. Are you able to hold a plate full of food? Um, and then we have some of the pain interference items that Karen mentioned earlier this morning. So for the participant, it just goes from one instrument to the next. They don't know they're on a second instrument. Um, it would be seamless with any custom items you would write or instruments you would add. Um, manually um, that aren't part of the library. They get a completion message and they're done. So how can you do that? How would you start doing that? Um, what you would do here is you would navigate to this website, ac.nindes.nih.gov, and you would log in with your existing NIH username and password. And this is the NIH Assessment Center homepage. You can see um, it has some descriptive information and then five links here, um, one of which will direct you to Assessment Center, where you do all your study setup, and the second link, AC Light, where you do your data collection and extract your data. So this is Assessment Center. Um, when you are setting up your study, um, Assessment Center is organized by tabs. There are five tabs up there at the top. Um, studies, instruments, setup, preview, and administration. I'm on the studies page, and you can see um, I've been busy. I have uh, several studies listed here. Each one of those um, has a different set of instruments. This is also where you can identify who's on your study team. So if I wanted to add Karen Cook to my team, I would look for her name 
add her, and now she has the ability to um, extract data or add participants and whatnot. The second tab is instruments, and this is where you would pull in the instruments you would want to include in your study. So you can add instruments from the library. Um, as I did here, I have uh, the Promise Mobility Cat, Upper Extremity Cat, and the Pain Interference Cat. This is also where you would create items. So if I wanted to create um, the BPI, which is not in the library, I could do that. Although after seeing Karen's slides, why would I want to create the BPI? Right, so. On setup, this is um, an area where you would set your data, uh, your website up for data collection. Um, you can uh, set up when you want accrual to end or when you reach a specific target uh, sample size, you can stop. This is where you would customize that welcome page um, and you can add images and um, uh, modify the text with font color and whatnot. Um, this is also where if you needed to include an online consent form, you would do that, or if you needed multiple time points, you would do that here as well. So now all your study's done, you're ready to go, you launched it for data collection. Now you come back to the NIH Assessment Center homepage and you access AC Lite. Um, the first thing you do is you pull your study from Assessment Center into AC Lite on this Download Studies page. Um, it requires logging in. That populates a list of studies you have in Assessment Center. You check what you want and you bring it over. Um, this now is my study list in AC Lite. Um, you can see there are a number of studies that have been pulled over. I look at the one I want and I have the ability to either um, go to an administration area where I can see, um, well, I'll show you that in a second, uh, how many people have participated. Or I can click, if you have bionic eyes, you can read it says start. Um, so if I have a participant right in front of me and I want um, her to start data collection, I would click start and she'd be ready to go. If I had clicked administration, I see this page um, that you saw that Leslie showed. It shows a quick update on your accrual. I have a massive study goal of 25 participants and 13 people have accessed the study but nobody started it. So not a very effective um, recruitment yet. Um, and then down here, this is where I would export my data. Um, again, another sample data export. These open as CSV files, so they're ready to go if you want to open them in Excel, import them into SPSS or SAS. Um, and in Assessment Center are some nice tables that describe for you exactly what each column means. So um, we capture lots of information, um, including how many seconds a participant took to answer an item, a time and date stamp of when they provided that response. Um, and so you can uh, get a lot of information from these five different exports. Um, this is a lot to learn, and you have a lot of resources to help you learn the technology. Um, to learn AC Lite, um, there is a user manual, and it's on that home page under instruction, so you can go there and download that uh, manual and, and read more about AC Lite. There's also an AC Lite support desk that's available uh, by an email address and also by phone um, during normal business hours, not at two in the morning when you're um, having trouble, they'll return your call in the morning. Um, to learn Assessment Center, we have a lot of resources on the Assessment Center homepage, including some online video tutorials. So if you're wondering, how do I set up my own short form that's not in the library, can't figure out how to do that, there's a quick video you can watch. Um, if you prefer to read, you can pull down the user manual and that same information is presented in text form. And if you want to learn more about what to even include in your study, um, you should go to the study-specific websites. One of the things we found is people often go to assessment center not knowing what instruments they want to use um, and, and are puzzled because there aren't instrument selection guides within assessment center. Well, that's because assessment center is a data collection tool. 
not an instrument decision aid. And so I would suggest if you are not sure what to use, go um, to these really rich websites for Promise, for NeuroQual, and Toolbox to learn more about those measurement initiatives. Um, I will put in a plug as well on the Promise website. You could start following Promise on Twitter and learn about new developments um, from our colleagues at uh, Promise NIH. And there's also a newsletter you can sign up for, which is a nice way to just be um, kept up to date about what's happening within that initiative. The other websites also have really great instructional videos um, that I would recommend watching as well. Um, there's also a series that uh, Karen Cook did explaining IRT and CAT if you want a refresher or you want to share with a colleague um, more information about that. So lots of additional tools for self-guided learning. Um, so I'd like to um, end a little early and just acknowledge the funding that we've had for this work. One of the really fortunate things that happened was all three of these initiatives had PIs at Northwestern University. And so it allowed for a lot of synergy and for the ability for us to have this one data collection platform that can house all three. It's allowed us to have lots of opportunities to discuss differences between measurement systems, ways to, to utilize them independently or together. Um, and so that's been, that's been a real uh, plus uh, for, for this work. Here at the NIH, um, there's been a great team of folks uh, that have helped make AC Light happen, and we're very grateful for their assistance. They'll be leading the afternoon portion on learning more about hands-on how to use AC Light. And then at Northwestern University, um, we've got a really great informatics team of project managers, software developers, um, uh, customer support folks, um, and so I'd like to acknowledge all of their work as well. So I am going to wrap up here, um, and we will turn it over um, to Yang. Do you have anything you would like to add? No? He's, no. Okay. So I covered everything for Yang, too. So I think what we'll do now is we'll have the panel come up and do Q&A as a group. So it's uh, nice to finish early here, and we have plenty of time for questions. I don't think we'll be able to take questions from the outside. <clears throat> so if those of you that are viewing uh, do have questions, uh, feel free to send them to myself, and uh, we'll get them addressed. Uh, but I think we're just going to be able to take questions from the audience. So first one. Um, I have, my name is Ted. I'm a scientific review officer of NIAM. I have a very naive question about scale, and this question is for Dr. Cook. Um, maybe Richard. Uh, so different items have different scale, like a pen, you have zero and range from one to ten, zero, no pen. But for other, like for anxiety, if I understand correctly from Richard's slides, you have, one, you have five scale and depression you have four. So my question is, what's the basis for those skills? And, and uh, from um, cognitive science, there's a study show that pe most people a human brain can tell the difference between one to seven, maximally nine. Then, so basically, what's the uh, what's the basis for those numeric skills in order to make sure they reach the the, the they are optimized to reach the best sensitivity specificity? Yeah, it's an excellent question, and. Uh, Early on when Promise was identifying response, you're talking about the response scale, so the set of response options, right? Um, we had a great deal of debate about this, about how many, and the part of what was discussed is the research that you mentioned that shows that people typically can only discriminate maybe five to seven categories. So in Promise, I, I believe most of the scales are, are five response options. And we also tried within a domain, and actually somewhat across domains, to make those 
those um, to, to limit the numbers of response, different response sets with, the, with terms of the semantic label that's as, as to each of those. The only time where there's zero to ten, I think, is with the pain intensity item that's used in the general form. That's the only time zero to ten. And I agree with you. In fact, you know, David Sella and I have done some of you know we actually get together have a publication about showing that people can't discriminate that many levels. However, the 0 to 10 scale has got, as you probably know, within the pain community, a, a huge history, and we were really encouraged to use that for pain intensity. Now, there is a group within Promise that's experimenting with the use of a so-called mini bank for pain intensity that includes um, uh, several, several five response category items. Now, in terms of the mathematics of it, the graded response model, which is a kind of item response theory model that we use, handles different items with different categories with no problem. So it doesn't interfere with the measurement properties, which it, it would if it was classically done, right? But within the item response theory model, it handles it nicely. Next question. Uh, I'm Dr. Santosh, and I'm from King's College London. Uh, what I wanted, uh, there were two, uh, two things that I wanted to find out. One is, this, uh, taking on from the previous question, uh, do you actually think that children aged four would have the same capacity to look at things in terms of a dimension of five options compared to an 85-year-old? Uh, simply because developmentally, for children aged uh, below eight, they can d distinguish three options easily, but anything more than that becomes very difficult. Uh, and similarly, there is a developmental science behind it in terms of the number of options that they can actually ma manage. So, uh, I mean, how has that been taken into account when developing it, especially now that you're trying to develop the link between the child and the adult modules? Uh, that's one. And the second one is basically to do with confidentiality of patient information. Since the system seems to generate an email to the patient asking them to, to go online, and then answer questions, how, how is that being taken into account? Because uh, then, the, by definition, the email can be an identifier that can track who is responding. <laughs> so I'll answer, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll probably not answer the pediatric question. Um, I, um, I'm representing the pediatric folks, so I probably won't do as good a job as, 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 as they would. Um, I think you're right, and I know that you know that in terms of it, a, a lower developmental level, people don't discriminate as many categories. And I know that, and I don't, I don't know the specifics about the pediatric item parameters, but I know that for some promise items, when there is not that level of discrimination, sometimes those categories have been collapsed, so that they're scored as though they're really, you know, three categories instead of five, or four categories instead of five. So that may have been how it's handled. Um, I, you know, if you email me later, I'll be happy to find out a more specific example. As far as security, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Gershon. Okay. Well, let, let me, I, I will answer the uh, first question. Um, and, and that's okay. The, no, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. The, uh, both Promise and NIH Toolbox for self-report don't recommend below age eight for the uh, emotional health items. Um, and both banks offer self-report starting younger, I'm sorry, proxy reports starting younger than that. Um, at five. At five, for, five. Five for Promise, age three, and, uh, and at three for proxy report, even with the NH toolbox. Um, there's a bracketed age band in the middle through about age 12, where it's a recommendation you may want to do both. And then above that, usually the recommendation is you can take you know, child self-report. But th there's an agreement. There's, no, uh, none of these efforts have attempted to tackle self-report in kids younger than age eight. Um, the security side. So as for um, security of data, um, so the first thing is the system does not email a participant. The system um, would allow a researcher to make a decision about contacting a participant. Um, the second thing is that the researcher has the ability to include protected health information like email address or name in their study or to not include it. And so if there are security concerns, they could opt to not include that in the data collection platform. Um, and then another thing we do is a researcher does have the ability to email a participant and say you're due for an assessment. 
um, navigate to this website, but the participant has to log in with their own username and password in order to get in to complete the data collection. Um, and so in that way, uh, the email isn't tied with the actual patient-reported outcome data that's being collected on assessment center. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the reason I'm uh, asking that is that in, in the UK, for sure, the, this would be a problem. Uh, because the fact that there's an email being sent to a patient, to the, per, the, the email of the patient yeah. I, I, by, by nature would be an identifier. So, so if, that was, if that was a deal breaker, and then I would say don't email patients. Um, if you're interacting with patients face to face, you can provide them with the URL, their login and, and password, um, and have them access it independently without an email prompt from you. Okay. And I should Wait. point out there, uh, numerous instances, some of the projects we mentioned earlier today of individual institutions that have integrated the promise instruments with the electronic health record, very often the uh, email prompt is From you have a message in your, in Epic's case, my chart record, you have, a, you have a communication that we'd like you to address, and by the way, it might be that their prescription's ready, it might be that they have to confirm their appointment, et cetera. Once they then log in, then the nature of that is raised. And, and that's the experience that we had here. We were having some concerns um, about emailing our, our participants. And what we did is precisely what they said, is email them the link because the link is quite long. But we also give that to them in paper format. And the codes, their username and access codes are never um, in the same correspondence. So basically, it's a link to the survey. And um, we did check with our safety office, our security office, and um, they advised that just the email with the link was acceptable because it didn't have protected health information. Um, but you. we do have the secure messaging systems as well to email our patients. Thank you. Hi, I'm Erin Kent from the National Cancer Institute. I'm curious about the, um, when you showed the equivalency scores between the legacy measures and some of the promise items, for example, if mode differences were taken into account. So if you're interested in sort of seeing what um, an historical survey has given you in the past, say, with the SF36, how that would map onto some of the promise items, but if, if mode differences, like paper and pencil versus, you know, cat, had been taken into account. Uh, lots of answers. <laughs> uh, Promise has uh, funded numerous studies that look at uh, mode, um, even mode within Promise, because within Promise uh, we have everything from uh, paper and pencil forms filled out on paper to uh, paper, short forms filled out on computer versus CAT. Um, the nice thing with um, all mode studies that I'm aware of when it comes to self-report all, mode ends up being a non-issue, except when you take into consideration um, a uh, person live giving. So Caddy, in, in a, a uh, place where you have a research assistant asking questions, that's where you get incredible variation, regardless of the instrument type, uh, because there's either a demand characteristic there or, or a not wanting to give some kind of answer in front of people. But all the mode type studies, be it within promise or cross uh, promise have generally been negative. Um, they do, even for all kinds of computer-based testing, the only place that's ever found a major difference is in reading, long reading passages on paper versus computer. Um, and it turns out, yes, there's a difference if you have the entire passage available to you in front of you versus just looking at a window, although that's rapidly changing because more and more people are getting primarily learning how to read on a small screen. And so yeah, I think even that difference will disappear over time. So I'll add about the, st the specific PROMISE study that looked at mode effects. And um, there was a study within PROMISE that looked at um, this, uh, like a tablet, or uh, I think it lo looked at like a smartphone screen and looked at paper and pencil form and looked at mode effects. And the mode effects were smaller than the standard error of measurement, which means, you know, yeah, exactly. Hi, uh, so this question is directed at either at Richard uh, or Nan, or anyone else who might be able to answer it, actually. Uh, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, what we used to call HRQL, health-related quality of life, now called patient-reported outcomes tools out there. 
Um, and uh, everybody has a favorite that's been involved in clinical research, um, and that has actually driven the expansion of the number of tools over the years. Um, the, the question is, uh, I'm, I'm not exactly clear, but it, it sounded like if you have a favorite tool and you don't want to use one of the tools that's been, uh, you don't want to use one of the scales that's included in these, either any of these toolboxes that one could use the tool that one likes. If I like the EORTC or the FACT or, or whatever for cancer, uh, there are a number of uh, AIDS-specific tools and so forth, that I could use that tool if I, if I didn't want to use the questions that get at those issues uh, that are available to me um, uh, in, this, uh, in these toolboxes. Is, is that correct? And uh, what, what might be uh, done to sort of get the word out to clinical researchers, particularly those in, in clinical medicine that uh, may not be aware of this project or, or may not be as familiar with it or, or, or may not understand statistics and, and just wants to use the tool that they've always been using to capture that kind of information. So I'll start and then others can chime in. Um, so the first, the first part is, Yes, you can use an existing legacy tool, and through the work in Prosetta Stone, there are linking tables with some widely used legacy tools with a promise metric. Um, I think part of the rationale is, is we're thinking that we're in a transition period. The first promise instruments um, came out in 2007. Um, we're right on the cusp of another huge wave of additional promise instruments being released. And so they don't have that very rich legacy of lots of publications demonstrating their usefulness in a variety of clinical populations. Right. These aren't actual instruments, though. They're, they're scales that get at particular concepts or, or facets or mm -hmm. that sort of thing. You're not actual, you don't have an HIV-specific tool. So, so you're asking relative to assessment center, putting it in there? So I, I, I'm asking, yeah, how the, if, if I have a specific area that I want to measure as a clinician, uh, to to, tra to track the progress of my patient over time, mm -hmm. whether in clinical practice or in research, um, that uh, some of these concepts are like, I'm sure, are covered within Promise or any of the other toolboxes, uh, but I may not know that as someone who has been doing research in a field for a number of years. This is new information. Um, so how is that, yeah, is there something that is in this, the assessment um, um, mechanism that, that you've just described today that says, um, FYI, there's a new way of going about doing this, uh, although I, it's a data capture instrument, so it might not be there, but, uh, you know, there, there might be a way to sort of alert people that, that want to continue and have been doing research in a particular therapeutic area um, and they, they don't necessarily know what's in the tool, but they know that they like to use this tool, and it helps them track the progress of their patient on their therapy and so forth. But how would, how would I, so I'm asking a couple of questions here, but how would I, as a clinician, know that there's a new way to go about doing this? Um, how's that message getting out there? And, uh, and even if I don't want to do that, uh, can I still use my legacy tool how do, how do I know if that tool is one of those tools that's been mapped to, uh, into Promise or one of the other toolboxes? So I think what you're talking about is outreach. Um, how, how can Some we let the, outreach, yeah. the clinical world and the research world know about these tools? Um, we're doing that through events like this. Um, there, there is a grant that um, will be funded, we hope, really soon um, that aims to do more of this outreach work to identify what are the target clinical areas, how can we um, get information to clinicians and clinical researchers about these new tools and how they compare to legacy tools and show them data about why they would want to switch. So okay. data like what Richard presented showing you're doing a clinical trial, you're not going to capture change if you continue to use the SF36. Um, I think if we can demonstrate that, um, it will help. I think. Uh, we have lots of outreach efforts within the Promise Network. Um, I think Jim Witter has been championing um, outreach with Promise at clinical meetings, in, in, in 
webcasts and all kinds of things. And so I think, I think we're trying to do that, um, but, but it's a huge audience and there's a lot of um, inertia with, with measurement selection. I should point out the Institute of Medicine has an active effort right now to identify instruments that would be available across systems. Uh, PCORI has numerous efforts in that regard as well. Uh, EPIC is looking for someone to say and has asked the Promise Network, identify which instruments by disease should be recommended to people. They have a default um, instrument area that if you, it, uh, it's actually full clinical management area that it's, uh, uh, I forget what they call it, but it says, look, if it, with a disease X, a diagnosis of X, Here's what we recommend for clinical workflow. Here is instruments we'd like to suggest. I think we're really at the early side of it. It's clearly a critical opportunity. And I think, as we mentioned a couple different ways, within assessment center, if you have a scale or another instrument, there are ways of adding it in so the patient doesn't perceive that they're bouncing between systems to be able to answer uh, surveys. Right, it's just something to think about as, as this evolution takes place. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard enough uh, getting insight into the field because it's been you know, the quality of life field has been rapidly changing ever since it was first named. And so, you know, it's a, it's a moving target. And, and to the extent that this, that, that this kind of outreach and meetings like this uh, take place, I think that's to the benefit of all, all people who treat and research patients. So, just a yeah. thought. If I, could, if I could just add, I mean, to what Nan was saying, one of the hats that I wear is that we're for chair of the outreach committee. And, we discuss this all the time. How do we get the message out? We've tried uh, all available uh, venues, as, as you might imagine. We've had Twitter chats. Uh, we have the newsletter. Uh, we have an email blast of over 4,000 recipients. So please, if you'd like to join us, please do. Um, we have venues like this. Uh, we, we do, and, and the, the network is, as you saw, is large. So all of us here and people that you don't see uh, we regularly do sort of outreach, as you're saying, to get the word out, um, because I think what's going to happen given time is when these measures start to be used, especially in clinical settings and, and, and research settings, people will start to see how they compare with what they're familiar with. And they'll go, oh, this is not only as good as, it's hopefully better than what it is for the reasons that we've heard today. It's briefer, those sorts of things. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a major effort that we're trying to do. So and my request to you would be to help us to do that. Right, I, I think doing these kinds of uh, forums at the large clinical association meetings, neurology, cancer, AIDS, I think that would be very helpful because you, you, know, you get a lot of, um, right. you're probably doing that. So. And, and PCORI has, uh, has picked this up as well. There is currently a PFA uh, specifically devoted to PROMISE. Um, and that's a, what we hope is an initial interest on their part. We're hoping, and they put out an RFI uh, at the same time to really glean from the community uh, what sorts of um, ways can they help to facilitate promise in all sorts of you know, uh, populations and venues. Uh, that we hope will be leading to a more substantial effort on their part to fund promise related research and, and use, uh, particularly in sort of CER type settings. So, uh, the, the future looks, I think, very bright and very promising, no pun intended. And this stuff needs to be taught in medical school because it isn't. Agree. Next question. My name is Josh Kasman. I'm from Uniform Services University. I was just wondering whether there are any efforts to develop tools as well to measure health behaviors, such as exercise or diet, which is another area plagued by um, poor measures. Um. There's an effort right now in PEDS to develop a measure of self-report of physical activity. Um, within adults, there is a measure of smoking um, as well as alcohol use, but otherwise, I don't believe there's any development happening in health behaviors. They know something. Did we have a question before about uh, Pastor from USIS? It's been addressed already? Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, <clears throat> well, just to remind you, uh, we, we don't have, like I said, uh, capabilities for, out, for questions from the outside. But if you do, those of you that are watching, uh, feel free to email me. Uh, my email, email address is james.witter, it's like Twitter without the T, at nih.gov, and I will make sure that we uh, get your uh, question answered. One of the things, and I do have a question for Yang, uh, I'd just like to point out one of my hopes is that this will be the beginning of facilitating 
uh, collaborative sorts of researches between intramural and extramural researchers uh, like we've been doing in other venues. But I have a question for Yang. Um, when might we expect to see uh, these tools available in Chris and Beatrice? Okay, so now we're just in a pilot. So we need to have more researchers join into the study using our AC Live in conjunction with the, uh, working with the uh, Northwest team. The data is exportable. And we have a study that we have identified we can link back to the beaches. So that effort can be done without too much of it. But we need more study to join into the system in order to make it a worthwhile. Because if it's just a one or two, and I ask the Beatrice team to spend the effort to do all this data linkage and all that, it will be a lot of effort. So we're hoping to expand this one and this data export it to the Beatrice. At least that will be much easier. The quiz, on the other hand, is a little bit trickier because, as you say, you have to probably use an API uh, that Northwestern has created. And quiz team right now has overwhelmed uh, task and project to be able to implement our API. But it's a possibility, I can see. I mean, but that is at the uh, quiz team, a clinical center, which it, I could also work with them as well. OK. Um. If there's no further questions, uh, just to remind you then uh, that there will be more extensive hands-on training this afternoon. Uh, it's going to be in Building 12A, you know, specifically in Room B51. Uh, that starts with registration at 1 o'clock and it goes till about 4.30. So those of you that are really going to be doing sort of the hands-on, um, it's, a, it's a very excellent training. I think you're going to learn a lot. So please, if you haven't, uh, I think we're signed up already, but uh, if you haven't signed up, um, feel free to check in and I think there might be some spaces we'll see. But thank you very much for attending and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for the opportunity.